Welcome back to the 411 Podcasting Network. I'm your host, Larry Zonka, and this is episode 55 of the 411 on Wrestling Podcast. You can follow us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube, and of course the 411mania.com website. Please make sure to subscribe to our show, share us around on social media, and if you have time, leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Joining me today, as always, is my co-host, Jeremy Lambert. Jeremy, how are you today? Very good, Larry. I was trying to get my words together, but I was going to say fired up, but it's too early to be fired up. But I'm still very good after the night of wrestling we just watched. I I agree. Yeah, it is a little weird. We're, we usually record late at night, and I, I feel like very odd recording in the morning. Yeah, I'm still almost trying to wake up, but... I'm here, plenty to talk about, plenty of good stuff to talk about, which is always helpful. So I am excited. Maybe not quite fired up level, but definitely excited. Fair enough. I, I kind of feel the same way. But yeah, we have a lot to talk about. We had the debut of AEW Dynamite on TNT. We had USA uh, or NXT making its maiden voyage as a full two-hour show on the USA Network. And we're also going to talk about the SmackDown debut on Fox and a little bit of Hell in a Cell because there's only a little bit of Hell in a Cell to talk about as we record Thursday morning. So, Jeremy, like you said, it's a lot to talk about. Uh, I thought Wednesday night was really great overall. I was very happy with everything. And it's... Um, there's no way it can be that good every Wednesday night, but I'll tell you what, if it can if it can even be close to that on Wednesday nights, what we got last night, we're going to be in for a lot of good times as wrestling fans. Yeah, we'll we'll discuss it when we get to our big kind of comparison thing, but uh, last night was amazing. I don't think it's going to be as good, that good every single week, but if it is, even better. I still think it's going to be very good every single week because both of these companies or brands, I guess, uh, in NXT's case, know what they're doing and know how to appease uh, fans like us. Exactly. So it was a very good time Wednesday night. We are going to start with AEW Dynamite, mostly because it's the one I watched first and because it's uh, it also was making its debut, which again... Obviously, for anybody downplaying this company still, the fact that they are on TNT after no wrestling on that network for 20 years, after the fall of WCW, the biggest TV deal in a long, long time for a company not named WWE. Yes, uh, Impact had Spike TV for a little bit. But the fact that we got this happening right now in 2019, huge deal for numerous reasons. Um, the building looked great last night. There was uh, 14,129 sold. Jim Ross, Excalibur, and Tony Schiavone were on commentary. And before we fully kick in on the show, I do want to say that I thought the AEW commentary team last night was actually really great overall. Probably the best commentary the whole company has had so far. Uh, I thought that Tony Schiavone was really good and a ton of fun. Uh, if you've seen him in MLW, he's been really good. But he was really good last night. He uh, came across really well. I thought he tied things together nicely. Excalibur, again, was really awesome. And I honestly thought that last night's Jim Ross performance was the best Jim Ross I've heard in a long time. Jeremy, your thoughts on the commentary before we fully dive into the show? I'm with you, all three. I I credit Tony Schiavone a lot here because we've seen Ross, and he can be kind of hit and miss. Excalibur is usually – he's been solid on every single show he's been on. And then you've had Marvez, who adds Horrible. literally nothing. Or uh, Golden Boy, who I think Golden Boy did a good job. He did. I think – I think the problem with Golden Boy is, and it's not his issue, is Jim Ross doesn't get him. And so they, they come off as a little, Ross comes off a little condescending when, when talking to him. So you throw in Tony Schiavone, who adds as much as Golden Boy does with his commentary, but Ross clearly has a respect 
and, and like to Tony Schiavone. So Ross isn't going to take little cheap shots or try to get into little tit for tat arguments with him like he was doing with Golden Boy. So I think that's why Tony Schiavone was really the the missing link there is because he's a professional, he's very good at what he does, and Jim Ross has that uh, respect for him. So yeah, I. I thought the commentary was was very good though. It didn't, you know, I didn't notice it as, as being a bad thing throughout the night where I'm like, oh my God, just shut up. And granted, I, I watched both of these shows at the same time, so I wasn't completely paying attention to commentary on either of the shows, but I I could definitely tell a difference between the two. And certainly um uh the 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 AEW commentary was very good. So we uh, we kicked off with uh, the match we all knew was kicking off the show, Cody versus Sammy Guevara. Um, this was a match I know going into uh, myself and a lot of people were a little, little bit of question mark around it. Um, it was stylistically very different. Um, when Cody came out, Jeremy, godlike reaction for Cody in this building. He was always going to get such a big reaction. Uh, Cody is. Aside from Jericho, and Jericho's a heel, so um, his reactions maybe won't be quite as big, but people still recognize the greatness of, of Chris Jericho. Cody's the biggest star in the company. I don't think there's any argument to that. He is the biggest star in the company, and he was clearly emotional coming out. Great job on him to, to hold it together. I see why Cody uh, wanted that first match and that first entrant. Uh, he was adamant about having it leading up to this whole thing and this was why like he he was the biggest star in chicago he was the biggest star uh in vegas like he is their top guy and he's been great i we've both knocked him for his work in roh and new japan but man his aew stuff has been really good agreed yeah and he uh but yeah he came on he got the god pop man the, these people these people loved him, and like say he, if he isn't, you know, I mean, and I'm not saying he isn't, but like, it's like even if you think he isn't, he came off like the biggest star in the company, and you you can't doubt that with the crowd reaction he got. So he came on, you know, Sammy Guevara comes on, he, he's a swarmy little asshole. He he just has such a he has a punchable face. He looks like a douchebag, and. That played well into the match, you know. So Cody is obviously he's he's the big baby face right now, um, and so Cody wins the match twelve minutes via pin. I thought they had a really good opener. Uh, the atmosphere absolutely great. They worked together way better than I anticipated. Um, Sammy brought a, a lot of flash. Cody was over. Cody kept it a little more, uh, you know, grounded. It wasn't a long storytelling match like he's used to, but it never got out of control, never got over the top, but it played its role really well as an opener because Cody was so over. Um, as the match went on, Sammy started getting over more as a heel, especially when they did the spot where when Cody went for the suicide dive and Sammy pulled Brandy in the way, and he wipes her out. And right away, he started getting the asshole chance. People did not like him, so I thought that came across really, really well, and um, he put in a really great performance overall in a losing effort. He looked really good, and it's also a little continued trend because, um, you know, Cody has won his matches. He beat Dustin. He, he went to a draw with Darby Allen, and then he had a really competitive match here. But, like, it's a little trend that, like, the younger guys have given him fits in a little way. So, I, I did like how that continued here. I thought it was really good, really enjoyed it. And, uh, obviously, Cody winning is the right choice because he's going on to face Jericho at the pay-per-view for the title. Very good opening match. I was worried... I mean, the the result was never in doubt because Cody tried to be, like... You know, if I lose, Sammy Guevara could take my place. Like, you're not headlighting a pay-per-view with Chris Jericho against Sammy Guevara. Like, no one no one bought that nonsense. No, we knew Cody 
was was winning this match and so that took a little bit of the drama and the match was kind of an afterthought on the build-up like cody ignored it and that was clearly a, a thing to play into cody's not taking this serious and Guevara can kind of surprise them which is exactly what happened like they they told the right story here i was worried it would be kind of a, a sabian uh, hangman incident which which tony khan himself admitted went too long and did nobody any favors but the the difference there is people buy Cody they and they didn't buy Hangman leading into that match and then really coming after that match. Like Cody can afford to give Sammy Guevara offense in this match and not just completely squash him, even though he's about to have a, a world title shot because Cody's not going to lose anything. He he's made in AEW. And so they, they played to that well and that should Cody have potentially looked stronger because he's about to challenge for the title? Maybe. But because he's Cody and because they wanted to get Sammy Guevara over, they could afford to give Guevara more. I thought this match accomplished everything it needed to and I thought the work was good and overall just a really strong open to the show. I really like the finish too because one thing I always appreciate is like, Sometimes somebody hits misses something from the top, and then it's like you just kind of go on to the next spot, and it's like there's never any consequence to missing that spot. And the finish here is you know, they're they're going, they're doing some really cool stuff. They did a Spanish fly, and Sammy pops up top, and he's going to go to finish it with the shooting star press. Goes up top, hits a really pretty looking shooting star press uh, until he hits the knees of Cody. And then Cody just cradles him and pins him. And so him not connecting with the move had consequence, which I really appreciated. Yeah, it was nice to see a match that just didn't end with a finish. It was... It, they they played it perfectly and it showed that Cody like all right Guevara still young made a mistake missed that move Cody took advantage of it and and that was that so I thought this was the the perfect way to open the show and and Cody and Guevara did a great job and then the post match uh, continued on uh, Tony Schiavone came to the ring to interview Cody and you could tell Cody very emotional here as he shares a hug with Tony Schiavone uh, nice little moment there obviously shades of uh. You know, probably just thinking back to all the times Tony Schiavone interviewed Dusty after a match on uh, on the on the mothership on uh, 605. And so Sammy Guevara interrupts and it looks like he's going to attack Cody, but he instead shakes his hand. And you're like, OK, that's a nice little moment until Chris Jericho arrived and beat the ever shit out of Cody, hit him with a couple code breakers, took him to the floor, set up some chairs, hit a big power bomb onto him and uh Chris Jericho reminded everybody, like, I'm your champion, motherfucker. So, uh, <laughs> yes, the uh, the build to the pay-per-view uh, was off right there. So, Cody picks up his win. You have a nice moment with Tony Schiavone. And then Chris Jericho ruins it like the asshole he is. And then he uh, took a selfie with uh, the camera. I thought that was great. Um, on the attack, and I, I don't know if this is going to play into more but where was mjf yes exactly nobody came out to save cody yeah and you know the friendship with cody and mjf has been a big talking point and uh, no mjf here no pharaoh either where were you you're you're supposed to be a better guard dog than this i know he's supposed to be a service dog who the fuck was he helping yeah so that was the start to show overall. I thought really strong start to the debut show. Speaking of your boy MJF, he arrived. Did a little bit of promo time before his match. Basically just running down the crowd for being uh, losers, just like his opponent, Brandon Culler. Uh, they properly hated him because he is a good asshole. So that's all that mattered there. Brandon Culler versus uh, MJF here is our second match. MJF uh, won in a hair under three minutes via submission. Uh, kind of an odd match. It, it was perfectly fine. There was nothing wrong with it. It was going along well. Brandon Cutler hit a big tope to the floor. I uh, beat the shit out of MJF a little bit. Then back in, he went up top, and then he kind of slipped off the ropes, favored his knee, and then MJF attacked him, put him in an arm bar, and got the win. I'm not sure if... He slipped and they just said, okay, let's go to the finish because I fucked up. Or he slipped because he, uh, like, tweaked his knee. I hope that isn't the case. But uh, 
Obviously, MJF was going to win. It's, it felt really weird because it like went right to the finish, and like I feel like if it, like if it was planned, like MJF would have attacked the knee and then su- submitted him. But like he didn't attack the knee, he just like took him down, armbarred him, and that was it. So kind of an odd finish. Like I said, Hope Cutler isn't hurt, but MJF winning obviously the right call. Yeah, uh, Brandon Cutler didn't show a whole lot in this match. Um, I, he had a good Tope Suicida, I think, but this was designed to get MJF over, and it, it did that. He got a little promo work. He beat the guy in short order, and that's what it should have been. I didn't have an issue with this, and hopefully, as you said, Cutler isn't hurt. The match didn't need to go any longer. No. So in that regards, like it was, it was good. Hopefully again, he, he's not actually hurt and that's why it got cut. But at the same time, it shouldn't have gone any longer than it did. Yeah, exactly. And that's the other thing too. Cause it's like, it's nice to have varying times and matches. Not everything has to try to be match of the night or an Epic. And, uh, especially this match, it did not have to go longer. And like, People are going to make an argument like Cody didn't need to go 12 minutes with Sammy Guevara and maybe you should have squashed him quicker. But that would have made no sense with what they did later in the show. So you're right. This one did not have to go any longer. It fought for what it was. It wasn't bad. Like I said, the finish just came off a little odd because I'm not sure if he was hurt or if that was planned. It just came off very oddly. So uh, Then we went to ringside. Kevin Smith and Jason Mews were there from the... Uh, the old uh, Jay and Silent Bob deal, and uh, they hyped the new movie, which Chris Jericho was in. Then Jack Evans and, and Helico interrupted, and they gave Jack Evans a live mic, which was a bold fucking move. So <laughs> he, uh, he totally ran Don Smith and Muse, and basically made fun of them for being losers, and Private Party arrived to drink with Smith and Muse and kind of run them off, and that led to hype of the tag team tournament, which starts next week. Private Party and the Young Bucks. SCU video package in front of the White House. Uh, Scorpio Sky doing his best Barack Obama impersonation. Washington, D.C., of course, Jeremy, the worst town they have ever been in. And then they appeared in the building, and they actually looked really thrilled to be interviewed by Tony Schiavone, which I like that Tony Schiavone was kind of playing the Mean Gene Oakland role, because that's a really good role for him. Uh, Again, kind of the... uh, Like, going back to the studio interview days, which uh, he's been good at, they announced that Daniels and Kaz will represent them in the tag team tournament. The Lucha Bros arrived, proclaimed they were the best tag team in the universe, and they brawled. Okay. There was nothing wrong with any of these segments. They were all, like, fine segments. It got the people in the tag team division on television and whatnot, and, like, that that's never a bad thing. My issue with these segments is SEU is not facing the Lucha Brothers and Private Party is is not facing Angelico and Jack Evans. And Angelico and Jack Evans aren't even in the tag team tournament. So I guess it made sense that they'd come out there to get in the face of of Jason Mewes and, and Kevin Smith if that's what you wanted to do. I think this just could have been used. This time could have been used better. The the video package with SEU was very good. Having stuff for the live audience is is always good. Um, I would have done just better. I would have done video packages on like private party since they're facing the young bucks next week, and they we should know who private party is. Like them coming out and kind of for a three second shot to help not even help out like Smith and Muse just like walking or coming down the aisle or whatever. Like they, they looked like to uh, an untrained eye, like street profits ripoffs. And that's not what AEW wants to present. And I know that's not what a uh, private party wants to present because they hate that comparison. But if you're just a casual person watching it and you watch both shows and you've never seen private party before, you're like, all right, these guys with their cups and stuff like they're it's the street profits. Um, 
I just thought there could have been a better use of time here to really get over the tag team tournament and really push the matches that are going to happen. Like you, you push two matches that aren't happening in your tag team tournament. Maybe they happen down the line, but a month from now isn't as important as a week or two weeks from now. And you should have had jungle boy and, and Luchasaurus on here as well. I, I, the segments weren't bad. I just don't know if they really accomplished anything for the tournament and the matches that they're trying to to push. Agreed. Like you said, on the surface, they weren't bad or they didn't take away from the show in any way. But uh, better allocation of time to get things over. Like you said, a good video package on a private party would have been good. Uh, you know, SCU, you could have done a video package on them, something, or, you know, like the, uh, the Jurassic Express, whatever, just something, uh, probably would have been better for them to get, cause people actually know who SCU are compared to the Jurassic boys. So yeah, Here, here's, yeah. here's what, here's what I would have done is quick booking that off the top of my head here you do. Cause they clearly wanted to do something for the live audience and they wanted to get Kevin Smith and, and Jason Mewes involved. So you do that whole thing. You do in Helico and Jack Evans, you actually have jungle boy and Lucha express or, or Luchasaurus come out, uh, to kind of run them off because if you recall the way jungle boy and Luchasaurus got into the tag team tournament is a fan voting poll over in Helico and Jack Evans and you know, whatever that, that seems stupid, but at least there's something to play off there. They did a dark match. You do a dark match between those two teams and you release that dark match online and be like, Hey, I know you guys voted them in, but they also beat them in, in a tag team match as well. Something like that. Like, I, I don't know. You just could have done, done this whole, whole thing better. No, I like it. That, that makes a lot of sense. And again, it's a, Allocating your time properly, which again, we, we said going into this, this is something that they're going to have to learn how to do because they have not produced TV yet. This is week one. There's going to be missteps. And I think if you want to look at the show, this was definitely a segment of time they could have used better. So yeah. Yeah, by the time we got to our next match, it felt like there had been an hour with no wrestling. Yeah, it, it, it did feel like a long time. In actuality, it wasn't super long, but it felt that way. Uh, so speaking of our next match, Pac versus Hangman Page. Pac winning in 13 minutes via referee stoppage. Um, I thought this was really good, uh, much like the opener, the expected winner, much like the opener. I thought Page put in his best AEW performance so far. He... Uh, felt energized, he felt full of fire, he worked really hard, uh, just way better than he looked in, obviously, the Sabian match, he looked better than he here than he looked in the Jericho match, uh, Pac was great, came off like a total star here, finish was great, he hits, um, counters the buckshot lariat, hits a low blow, the black arrow, and then the locked in the brutalizer until the referee stopped it. So uh, good stuff here. Pack is now two and zero in AEW, and with the way they're booking things, a big win over Omega. He beat the guy that just challenged for the championship. You have to imagine they are setting him up for a title match down the line. Pack has the exact same wins that Chris Jericho has, except that I guess Jericho has a win in the six man tag, but the exact same singles wins as Chris Jericho has, and. You know, Chris Jericho is the champion, so it would certainly feel uh, as Pac getting a title shot fairly soon. Um, he he would feel like the next challenger, uh, assuming Cody wins at full gear, and that's not you know a guarantee, but it seems like that's going to be the move. Uh, Pac would certainly make sense as the next challenger since they're going on wins and losses. The guy has the same wins that got Chris Jericho the title. As far as Hangman, he definitely looked better here than he looked in the first two matches, and that that's not a big surprise. Um, Kip Sabian, that match just too long, didn't just not booked well. That, so, I don't, some people say that match is still going on today, Jeremy. <laughs> I, I don't blame that on, on Hangman. I blame that on just whoever laid out that, that whole match. Uh, and, and Chris Jericho, 
I, I blame that on the fact that they didn't get Hangman strong enough for that match. Uh, I don't like his work was good in that match. So was Jericho's work. Like they worked really hard. The problem was no one cared about Hangman going into that match. And Jericho, let's be honest, he's not the wrestler that in this day and age is is her uh, the stages of their career it, it, that Pac is. So it's easier to have a better match with Pac in 2019 than it is with Chris Jericho. So Hangman's good. We all know Hangman is good. He's just not been helped um, in his, his singles matches in AEW. And this one was the first time they really helped him. Something short against a, a good wrestler where he, he was able to shine. Agreed. Um, but yeah, big win for Pac here. And again, like we said, it makes complete sense that... Uh, He's going to be next in line for a title shot uh, because, you know, they're they're trying to make the wins and losses matter, obviously, which is good. I mean, I, I, I don't want to be totally bashed over the head with stats and analytics, but I do want things to matter. And that's why I really like the, the Pac-Page match because I felt Pac was going to win, but it also felt like Page had a solid chance. And I liked it because there was a decent bit of drama there. And the fact I liked it because the result was going to matter. Because if Paige picked up a win, it's a huge rebound win. And then there's a, a possibility that he can work back towards the title. And then if Pac wins like he did, you're automatically building up your next guy in line. And I appreciate little things like that. It's small but simple. Yeah, uh, good good booking here. So, Dr. Britt Baker arrived to join commentary, and we had the AEW Women's Championship match up next, Jeremy. Rio defeated Nyla Rose in uh, 13.45 via pin to become the first ever AEW Women's Champion. I go to you for your thoughts first. I was skeptical on this match, largely because... I didn't like the way they got to this match. I thought the Road 2 shows built it up fairly well, and I, Riho was awesome in this match. Nyla Rose was, was very good as well. I don't want to take anything away from her, but Riho just being... They, they they told the right story, the David versus Goliath story. Nyla Rose, everything she did to Riho looked like it killed her, but Riho just kept fighting back and kept fighting back, and by the end of it, like the crowd was so into her. I, I tweeted... I don't know if Nyla Rose was the the plan, but if she is, like call an audible right now because Riho should win this match, and Riho won, thank God. Uh, and, and I thought that was the the right call, and she got a huge pop when she won, and I I, I like the call to put it on Riho. Nyla Rose would have seemed like the the easy call because of you know you you appeal to Cody said they're not trying to check a box but it certainly checks a box with uh Nyla Rose being transgender um and Riho isn't your typical I mean she doesn't speak English so you're not going to be able to like put that out there and have her cut uh kind of promos and stuff like that you're going to have to subtitle a lot of her stuff and that's not you know that might turn off some fans but AEW is is certainly they said they're going to be an alternative, and going with Riho as the, your champion is certainly an alternative move. So I like the call, and I like the match. Yeah, um, I was pleasantly surprised at the result. I thought they were going to have Nyla Rose go over. Um, I thought Riho was a much better wrestler, so I was hoping she would win. Very pleased with, with the result. Uh, rough spot or two here and there, but overall, good match. And like you mentioned, they had a hot crowd. They played the right formula. Um, they were behind Riho so much. Um, as the match went on, more and more they were behind her. And it was just, it was a great atmosphere. And the thing is, is like, it wasn't the best match on the show. It wasn't even the best women's match on the night overall between the two shows. But the crowd was so into it that it was a huge success in that aspect. And the fact is that they got a little 98-pound Japanese woman over who, like you said, doesn't speak English, who isn't widely known to a U.S. audience. And she was one of the most over things on the show when she won. So even I said she, like, aside from Cody... Like she got the biggest pop of the night. Yeah. So even if the match say was only okay, 
you have to give it a big success and a thumbs up due to the fact of the reaction they got. Because it was just, this crowd, they were into her. They were into the match. They were into the story. And they were into that win big time by the end. So, yeah, definitely a success. Very good. I was uh, very pleased with the results. As I said, I thought they were going Nyla Rose all the way. Same. So the the fact that they went, went Riho gives me even more faith in, in the company that they're willing to do different stuff and not appease to the audience that we've kind of a, come to expect a, a company to try to appease to. Yes. Uh, post-match, uh, Nala Rose uh, attacked Riho as Michael Nakazawa was trying to interview her. Then she uh, almost killed Michael Nakazawa trying to powerbomb him. She had to kind of double clutch (laughs) on that. Uh, Thankfully, he did not die. And then she was going to take Rio to the apron and take her out, but Kenneth Omega made the save. And uh, so that was that. And uh, Kenny Omega, if you've watched any of the uh, the Countdown stuff or the Road 2 stuff, uh, Kenny Omega has teamed with her in the past. He brought Rio in. So totally made sense to do that. It did, but the Omega kind of losing his marbles storyline is almost got lost in in that instance. And I don't know how much they're even pushing that on television. Like it wasn't uh, maybe the announcers brought it up, but it it wasn't like completely clear because they didn't really do a backstage segment outside of watching Omega get ready like with him. So I don't. That that's still a storyline where I don't know quite where it's going, and it wasn't like a, a big focus on television. So if they're underplaying it, like they underplayed it greatly, and Omega saving Riho would certainly be like he still gives a shit in in some regards to where if you're watching Being the Elite, it looks like he just doesn't care about anything and is completely lost all of his senses. Yeah, it's um. It's going to be interesting to see how they play out the Kenny Omega stuff, especially after what happened in the main event. So we will see what happens there. Yeah, it is a, it's a weird sword story to kind of follow because it's like, you know, if you don't watch being the elite, that feels like it's a totally different universe. So it's, I, I don't know how kind of how to take it. You know what I mean? It's, and they said they're going to keep being the elite separate from the show. And we're not going to see a lot of that stuff on their their television. But like they have television now, and they have used being the elite to to build stories, even for their like pay per view matches. So I think it's got to play some type of a, a factor in there. Otherwise, it's just as you said, like it's it's a spinoff. It's a separate universe, and whatever we see in Being the Elite, we're not supposed to think for the television show. If that's the case, then what is Being the Elite accomplishing outside of uh, appealing to, I guess, their their core audience that that got them there, which it which is great, but. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't like the kind of separate identities kind of thing. Maybe they're using being the elite like up, up, down, down. But at least we know up, up, down, down is a lot of out of character stuff. Like they're pushing being the elite as in character stuff. So it's it's a weird disconnect be, between the two right now. And granted, they've only had one television show. So it, I don't know if they can make the connection that quickly. But at some point, they're they're going to have to connect the two. Yeah, it it is. It's uh, it's a little weird. And again, like I said too, that's the other thing. It's, it's week one of TV, so we have to see how things play out. Uh, so we move to the main event, which was the Elite facing Chris Jericho, Santana, and Ortiz. Before we fully dive into this, uh, Chris Jericho, Santana, and Ortiz won. Here's the negative for me for this match. I thought it was very good. I thought it accomplished a lot of things. So they open up. Kenny Omega's working the opening stretch of the match with LAX. Doing fun stuff. It's good. Uh, him and the Bucks make the... Uh, they do the big clear the ring spot. Kenny Omega setting for the rise of the Terminator. And slowly behind him, you hear the crowd roaring. Slowly behind him, John Moxley rises like a demon from fucking hell behind him. Great fucking visual spot. That's the... Uh, the headline picture for the review on the site. Great, great image. 
he arrives and attacks Kenny Omega. They proceed to have a great brawl into the crowd. Uh, Jericho and the rest of the guys are working in the ring. These two are brawling into the crowd. They spill into a VIP area. They're brawling, they're brawling. And then John Moxley hits the Death Rider through a glass coffee table. Which is a great fucking spot. It's a great brawl. The image of Moxley popping up behind Omega is great. But 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 can I just ask how in the hell did this happen in front of the referee and it not be a disqualification? Yeah, they they were I guess New Japan lax rules here where they weren't gonna uh disqualify anybody. Uh I'm with you and you know, uh I they could, they obviously didn't want to do the disqualification. It was just meant to to set up Omoxley uh and Omega for the pay-per-view and add some heat there, but I I kind of get it to where you don't just want to throw a match out because he comes in and attacks him. At the same time, you kind of make your referee look stupid, and because they are like they're they're pretty big on like rules and stuff, you would think that there would have been some type of explanation. And I, I don't think the commentary team really explained that. You know, it's the main event. We're not just going to throw this out. It's just going to continue here. Yeah, it just came off a little weird. It didn't overly bother me too much, but at the same time, it kind of did. Like, I, it wasn't like pissing me off all night. Like, oh, son of a bitch, blah, blah, blah. But, like, it, it was just, like, slightly annoying. Like, I, I kind of wish, like, it would have happened, like, right before the bell rang. Or something, you know, just so it... Because, like I said, I, I don't like it in New Japan when the referee looks like a fucking idiot all the time. And uh, that kind of happened here. But anyway, I, I thought they had a really good main event uh, for what they ended up working. Uh, Twelve and a half minutes, really good stuff. I thought the Omega and Moxley segment in the middle was really great. And it was a great uh, setup for their pay-per-view match. And then we had the... Uh, the big closing angle of the first show, Jeremy, is Team Jericho runs wild at the end until Cody makes the save. Cody makes the save, save starts running wild, and then the punchable douchebag Sammy Guevara arrives and kicks Cody square in his fucking nuts. So, obviously, he's a heel and an asshole. Dustin Rhodes arrives and makes the save. He runs wild for a little bit. And then we the fucking people, Jack Swagger, arrives. Jake Hagar, Bellator MMA superstar, as they labeled him. He runs wild on Cody in the box and Dustin. Power bombs Dustin onto a table. Jericho hits the Judas effect on Cody. And the big heel unit stands tall to close the show. I thought, first of all, thought it was a really good angle to close the show. Number two, I, I like a good heel faction. Number three, I like that Sammy Guevara is included. I think that's really good for him. Next, I will say Jack Hagar looked great in his run-in. He got over in his run-in. You need big guys in the company. But, as I mentioned as we previewed this show and we talked about the possibility of him coming in, his post WWE work has been the fucking shit. His Lucha Underground run was bad. His MLW run was bad. His indie appearances were bad. Really bad. I can't state enough how bad they were. Now, I will give him a chance. Maybe he just didn't give a shit. Maybe he wasn't making enough money. Maybe he's motivated to be hanging out with Jericho again and working. I don't know. I'm not exactly thrilled to see him on my TV screen. Maybe he'll end up being okay. Hopefully he's more just like the heater for the group and just like the big guy that beats the shit out of people. I don't want to see him wrestle a lot personally. Maybe it'll work, Jeremy. I don't know. Not exactly thrilled about it, but I will give it a chance. 
with Hagar, Swagger, whatever. I, I mean, he's definitely going by Jack Hagar or Jake Hagar. I'm willing to give it a chance as well because, yeah, his, his post WWE stuff has all sucked. He didn't look motivated. He looked like he was just there for a paycheck and he, he built into his own head like WWE misused me. And so you should now bow down to me that I'm on the indie scene. And it's a it's same type of thing I wrote with Cody and Ryback, like Ryback felt like he had that same thing and then he just went off and did podcasts and Hagar just went off and did MMA while Cody is now the executive vice president of this damn company. Um, But I'm willing to give it a chance because there's a difference between working these indie shows and running in for a a company that was presumed dead in, in Lucha underground and now working on TNT every week for the, the second biggest promotion in the United States. I would hope he has that motivation. He has the motivation in his, his fights and whatnot. Like he's looked good in Bellator. Bellator is very smart. They give him a bunch of cans. Um, and like he fights again at the end of this month. They'll probably squash this dude. I don't think it hurts AEW in a sense that he's going to actively turn away viewers. I do think it goes against the rhetoric of, um, you know, we're fresh, we're new, we're not WWE cast offs. And then your first show is uh, an angle where you, it's a WWE cast off. And it, it's not even like, all right, getting Dean Ambrose, Sean Moxley was a huge fucking get. Getting Jack Swagger is like, this guy was popular five years ago. And then by the end of his run, he was just the, the we the people guy and like he was even having like bad matches then it was just uh, but i'll give it a chance he is and tony khan said the same thing and uh he's different from the from the majority of the rest of the roster like he is a big dude who can toss people around they got a lot of smaller guys a lot of high flyers um and, and swagger's a good base for them catch him toss him around he looks good in that instance like you you saw just the size difference of him compared to the rest of the guys just in this match so i like the five-man stable i think it's cool Jer. the other thing is he's gonna be attached to chris jericho and I'm not doubting anything Chris Jericho does at this point. The, this man is getting over literally everything you put in front of him. So if you attach him to to uh, Chris Jericho, you're attaching Hagar to Jericho. Jericho's probably going to get this guy over. And, I, you know, Santana and Ortiz, can we get them a name, by the way? Because Jim Ross just... He, he just come his guys, his boys. What, like, Jim Ross just couldn't remember their name. Like, can we, can we get them a tag team name that Jim Ross can remember? Um, and I always think anytime you, if their name is just their names, like it, they don't feel like a tag team. They need an actual team name to, to feel more like a tag team. And Guevara, it showed why he got a lot of shine in that opening match because it, he was part of the the big angle at the in the main event, and they they clearly have plans for him, and they should. He's he's good. He's a, a good talker. His vlogs are entertaining, and he's a good wrestler. So, I like the angle. I'm willing to give Hagar a chance. They've built up enough goodwill just off their pay per views and their their media sessions that all right, the this they deserve to see what they can do with Hagar. I'm not super thrilled about it. And I do think it's funny that they're kind of preaching diversity and stuff. And then they bring in this Trump guy. Um, Don't know about that call, but we'll see. Yeah. And you're aligning him with uh, Latinos, which uh, if you've uh, read some of the stuff Hagar said in the past, he's a, he's all for the wall. Yeah, and just it comes <laughs> it comes across really funny when you think about it. Yeah, that that's what I was alluding to there. But uh, you came out and said it. Yeah, I don't know if that's going to. Uh, I don't know what the AEW fan base is. Um, but I mean, I'm not a Trump supporter, and I don't think that they're obviously out there. There's more in wrestling. I don't want to get into politics. So let's just move on before yeah. I get myself into trouble. <laughs> I really don't either. I just. Uh too much bullshit uh okay so we'll go to closing thoughts now overall um i thought it was a very good professional wrestling show 
And more important, more importantly to me, it felt like a wrestling show and not a show with wrestling on it like Raw and SmackDown feels a lot of the time. We had a hot crowd tonight. I thought the wrestling was the focus on week one. I feel like the right people came out as winners. We advanced Cody versus Jericho and Moxley versus Omega, which are your top two pay-per-view matches coming up. So that's an important first step on TV because now we have TV to build to these pay-per-views. Um, I, I, you know, I, I really appreciate that. And we're going to find out how successful the wrestling format is. Cause it was, you know, it was heavy wrestling. We didn't have a bunch of backstage skits. We didn't have a bunch of interviews in the ring or on the ramp. Even very wrestling heavy show. Um, we'll see how that appeals to a lot of people in the ratings. Uh, it appeals to me cause I like wrestling. Thought Sammy Guevara came off really well on this show. Good performance against Cody, including at the big angle at the end. That's big for him. Uh, I thought the show had great energy throughout. I thought it was really enjoyable for week one. Felt like a success to me. They have to build off of it going forward. And kind of like you, you mentioned earlier, you have to we have to maximize the time better. You have to use it to get other things over. Like again, a video package on... Jurassic Express or Private Party, little things like that, really important going forward because if you're not going to have, it's impossible to get everybody on the show for any company, two hours, three hours, one hour, whatever you got, so you have to use your time the most, and like you said, uh, in that really weird uh, dead segment where we didn't have a match for a while and we had the Kevin Smith stuff and all that. Would have been good to have a, a really strong video package for Private Party, especially because they face the Bucks next week. So, uh, yeah, just uh, got to go moving forward. Have to use your time the best you can. Thought for a debut, though, Jeremy, very good show. Your thoughts? Definitely a good show for the debut. Um, I the My only complaint, I, I, I had a few complaints, but the, the biggest one was that section of promo uh the the kevin smith jason muse stuff and then the scu lucha brothers stuff it, because this was such a wrestling heavy show that long period of of stuff there almost felt out of place like th- i think those two show two things aside from just they should have done something better to build up something for next week those two things should have been um uh, spaced out better. It shouldn't have been back to back like that. I, I think they they could have done that better. I also think they could have pushed next week a little bit better because, yeah, we know the tag team tournament starting. Like they mentioned, the Young Bucks are facing Private Party, but they didn't do enough to get me excited about Private Party. Again, I think a, a video package would have worked better. I'm fairly certain Moxley is facing Sean Spears next week um i mean that was previously announced i I guess moxley is cleared i mean he put himself to a glass table i don't think you're doing that if you still have uh some type of infection and brawling through like the crowd and stuff so i don't think like you're gonna be all over in the crowd that we're coming into contact with them is the if this infection is is still a big thing so like they didn't push that at all. Like I would have liked to see a video package on Sean Spears to the point where like I tweeted after Pax when Pax two and O and Cody is two O and one. I completely forgot about the Sean Spears match and like this guy is just a complete afterthought. He he looked he didn't get over at all in the Cody match. Wasn't very really mentioned here. And like he's facing John Moxley next week. The, you've got to make the guy come off as sort of a threat. Like we know he's losing to Moxley um, because they're not having Moxley lose his, his first TV match going into the match with Omega. But you, you've got to build up the guy somewhat unless he is just a kind of a mid card guy. Still, give, give me a little bit of hope that Sean Spears can win. So I don't think they did a good enough job like getting people excited for what's on tap next week that they already have announced they they did in the fact that all right the closing angle was good i want to see where the five-man stable goes i'm excited about moxley omega and, and kenny and or um and cody and jericho but like you've got two matches announced for next week there wasn't really a much of a sell for that so 
couple of missteps there, but still overall, I, I'm with you. It was a wrestling show that felt like a wrestling show. Yeah. And again, like we talked about too, uh, if you're expecting AEW to be perfect straight out the gate, it was never going to happen. There are going to be growing pains. There are going to be things they have to learn from formatting. Uh, like Jeremy just mentioned in closing, building to next week. That's something you're going to have to do. Um, I, I think they could have done a little bit better job of that as well. Um, again, growing pains. You're going to have to. You're learning how to format TV. You're learning how to budget your time. And they're going to have to just make sure that they constantly improve on that. Because obviously there's a lot of talented people there. I think there's a lot of people with really good ideas there. But you have to make it all work in a weekly format. It's one thing when you're doing a show a month over the summer. But now you're into weekly TV and the game has changed. Yeah, and it's their first show. They're going to... Cody said they're going to listen to feedback. Hopefully he's got someone reading reviews. Hopefully someone's listening to this podcast. Um, and they, they take this stuff to, they, they take it as constructive criticism and they realize, Hey, okay, maybe we, we should tweak this a little bit. Cause I don't think we're the only people who have said this kind of stuff. I, I saw a lot of people kind of complaining that, uh, there weren't any video packages to, to introduce other people and that the, longer segment uh with with no wrestling felt like forever yeah so we'll we'll see what changes in week two uh so we're gonna move on jeremy nxt obviously on the usa network uh going head to head limited commercials and oh one thing to real quick on AEW too they uh unexpected tnt did a lot of screen and screen during the commercial breaks uh, which was uh, a nice counterbalance to what NXT was doing as well, because they did a lot of the same. So I don't think I don't think NXT had any commercials. I know they did the screen and screen stuff, but I think NXT was on your television like the entire time. Almost, there were times where they would go screen and screen, and then they would dip into a regular commercial for like a minute, and then come back. Oh god! I that, that clearly didn't notice times. it. Yeah, yeah. It it felt like it was just on my screen the the entire time, and this is something that I not gonna happen every single week. But you could tell they were they were playing against each other here. If you just watch the shows simultaneously, uh, like I did, like you could tell. All right, we're having this right now because they're at a commercial, so we're gonna give you, you know the near finish of our match. So you stick around to see the finish and everything. Like you can just tell that, that, and I don't know how much AEW was paying attention and felt like they were just running their normal show. Uh, NXT was paying attention. Yeah. And, uh, NXT did not fuck around, Jeremy opening no. match. NXT champion, Adam Cole, baby versus Matthew Riddle. Match went 1350. Adam Cole won. Defeating Matt Riddle via pin. Um, okay. I thought this was fucking excellent. Uh, this was a balls to the wall takeover caliber match. Uh, they unloaded everything on each other. Good, great near falls and finishes. Closing five minutes or so were absolutely outstanding. The crowd was great here. Um, just absolutely the right call to kick things off. Cole retains at the end. Uh, he is wearing a cast because he has a legit injury to his wrist. They're saying a fracture that he got like a month ago. So he's wearing a cast. Riddle kept attacking the arm down to stretch, trying to get him to submit. Uh, finally, Cole escapes. Fucking just punches him in the face with the cast. Hits the last shot. Pins Matt Riddle. And, um, yeah, Adam Cole retains. Uh, kind of clean, but not clean. No undisputed era finish at the end. Uh, no interference, but uh, he wins. And um, with Matt Riddle losing here, Jeremy, and um, some gentlemen coming back on the show, would not be shocked if Matt Riddle ended up drafted to Raw or SmackDown, especially because Paul Heyman is reportedly very high on him. The match, when it was announced that it was the opener, like I, I my hot take, bold prediction last week was that they were going to do 
some type of screwy finish, maybe a time limit, and I didn't think it was going to headline. I had the not headlining part was correct, but it was actually the complete opposite of a uh, – there was a little screwiness to it, but it wasn't – you know, we still got a winner. Um and it certainly didn't go to a time limit. It was actually like very quick, hard hitting sprint format. And Cole's hand is legitimately hurt. So I guess it, it, it definitely makes sense that you don't want this guy going 20, 30 minutes uh, with a legit like broken hand because that's probably not the best thing to do. Like the fact that he was wrestling in the first place may have not been smart, but uh, it's, it's, you know, it's mini takeover. It's takeover Wednesday. So Cole had to suck it up and go out there and, and wrestle and, um, it, but great match. Love this match. Um, just, just the fact that they did go out there and it wasn't like this 20, 25 minute Epic. Like you see in a lot of takeover main events. Instead, it was like 13 minutes. Let's just beat the shit out of each other, hit each other with our best stuff. And I like that Cole had to kind of break out the cast and, uh, knock riddle with that to, to get the win here. And I, I didn't think so on commentary, like, it was definitely night and day between AEW and, and NXT. I've never been the biggest Morrow fan. Like he completely missed that Cole used the cast. They called it like a forearm shot. And Morrow is just so excitable with this stuff. And I get it. Like the wrestling is really good, but they're also like telling stories and I think Morrow's excitableness and the fact that he has to work in his damn pop culture references, like he loses sight of the storytelling. And like that's an issue. I wish he would like Morrow was on a 20. I wish he could dial that back to a 15 and and just see the story that they're trying to tell in the match a- instead of Oh, he's got more pops than a pop socket. I'm very bad at this. Uh, you know, like something like that. It just, Morrow's just a little bit too much for me. And the AEW commentary, I thought it was just the, their tone was a lot more inviting. It's like, oh, these guys are welcoming. Morrow's just like yelling at you the, the moment you have the show on. Yeah, I, th- I think that's very fair. I, I like Morrow generally, but, uh, my man does lose the plot a little bit at times because he's. I love his passion. I love that he's fucking excited. I love that he's into it because it's like you compare that to like when you have like Michael Cole, who is just like a walking soundboard. It's boss time and all that shit. And he's like, he never sounds actually enthused about what he's talking about. It's and like the the forced laughter and all that shit, like in main roster commentary. So I love Mars passion, but I totally agree with what you're saying. He he needs to dial it back just a little, Holmes. You know, just a little bit. And on <laughs> Matt Riddle, I'm I'm with you that he <laughs> seems likely for a call up. Uh, you know, Triple H and Heyman, they have similar taste. Uh, they both like Balor, and they both like Riddle. They're going to have to give a little bit uh, in, in both instances. And it seems like almost a Balor for Riddle. Yeah, Balor is the guy who came back. And um, you'll talk about that more. And I have more to say on him as well. But Riddle makes sense to just go up to Raw. He wants that Lesnar match. I don't know if he'll get it right away. But Riddle, you beat him here. He could stay in NXT. But th- this guy is such a star that it makes sense to trade him up to the main roster and, and put him on Raw. Yeah, hell of a segue there. Yeah, after the match, Finn Balor arrived and Full Sail lost their this shit for ruled. him. What's that? Said so this ruled. Yeah, so Finn, uh, he, he returned to the NXT arena at Full Sail and he announced, he stared down with Adam Cole and announced that he's officially back in NXT. Obviously traumatized by The Fiend. So, uh, pretty crazy start to the show. Excellent world title match. Finn Balor returning, announcing he is back in NXT, and uh, I am down for that. First of all, if my man Finn can get paid the same amount of money working less dates in NXT and being probably much happier than he was on the main roster, good for him. Yeah, um, 
th- this is the Kevin Owens. Like, I almost feel bad for Kevin Owens because, like, this is what Kevin Owens wants, and his family lives in Florida. And I don't know if he's going to get it. I guess we'll find out on Friday. If he loses, then that's pretty giveaway that he's going back to NXT as well. Balor makes a ton of sense, though. Not like We talked about it when discussing kind of NXT and using main roster guys. There are certain guys that on the main roster that you can bring back to NXT or bring to NXT where the crowd is going to be like, yeah, this guy makes sense here. And we love this guy. We want to see this guy here. Balor might be at the top of that list. I don't think people understand because he's, he's been on the main roster for so long and he's been kind of floating in the main roster, like not doing a whole lot of importance. I don't think people understand how much Balor meant to NXT. Like he is Kevin Owens always puts him over for the growth of NXT. Like he's the reason they started doing live events. Like they started traveling more when they put the title on Balor because he could like, he carried that brand as the champion and he was over everywhere. Um, and this is, this is the right call. Balor is a guy. I like when you talk about guys who could come back to NXT and just feel over immediately it, to me, it's like Balor, Owens, and Nakamura. Those were the three guys that are going to come th- out there and just receive the biggest heroes welcome ever. And they they used Balor, and I'm all for that because he's he's going to be fresh on the brand. Is a lot of the guys that he's feuded with are now up on the main roster anyway, so he's got a bunch of fresh matches, and he came off like such a star to this audience and he like he's gonna be a star to this audience so i thought this was a great move i loved it and jeremy i'm not gonna lie all i could think of was i want three weeks of the undisputed era kicking the shit out of finn balor just beating the fuck out of him because he has no friends and then like four weeks in four weeks i want the undisputed era to be kicking the shit out of him and then i want the good brothers and AJ to arrive. Because we talked about this, Jeremy, when we talked about NXT going to two hours, and we jokingly said that what if Finn Balor joined back with his buddies? And they did a war games with the fucking Undisputed Era. And I know I'm probably just fantasy booking and I'm going to be depressed when it doesn't happen. But if it does, I'm down for that big time. I, it would obviously be great. I think you are fantasy booking in that I don't see it happening just because you could still tell the story, but the OC is such heels. And Balor is so clearly a face that they, they would they would help because he's one of their brothers. And so in that, it, it would make sense. At the same time, there would be sort of a disconnect there, and I don't know... I, I don't think people would really care because we're going to get the club, the bullet club against uh, the undisputed era in a war games. And like, who gives a shit if it's logical and it still is logical, but shades of gray brother. Uh, I, I'm not getting my hopes that high. It would be fantastic, but I'm not going to get my hopes that high. Yeah. I'm trying not to get my hopes up for it, but I, uh, I'm going to fantasy book it anyway. Just so, so if it happens, I can, I can do the, see, I called it. Ha ha ha. <laughs> no, but seriously, I, I, that'd be really cool. But, uh, no Balor back to NXT. Yeah. There's guys like Balor and Owens and Cesaro and guys like that, that can come back there to get the heroes. Welcome. They're going to be great. Tons of fresh guys to work with. And, uh, yeah, exciting times for Finn. Good for him. The Velveteen Dream, a gaggle of women in his couch arrived. Cut a promo on Roderick Strong. He wants a shot for his title back. And, uh, yeah, Velveteen Dream just uh, doing it up on his couch with all the ladies. Good times. Drew Gula. This is when oh, sorry, this, this is when I thought that they had the AEW format because Velveteen Dream comes out at the same time as Brandon Cutler. And you're like, yeah, I know who I'm watching out of these two. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it did seem that, that way. It was funny from what I kept seeing on Twitter. People talking about what was going on in NXT as I was reviewing AEW. So they announced that Drew Gulak will defend the Cruiserweight title against Leo Rush next week. So that's our first big match for next week. Headed off to... Looking forward to that. Yo, definitely, definitely. Uh, women's action, Jeremy. 
Io Shirai defeated Mia Yim 1445 via pan. I will go to you first. Io Shirai fucking rules. I uh, love this match. Really like Mia Yim because I haven't been super impressed. I said I didn't feel she felt ready for that title match against Baszler. The title match against Baszler didn't do much of anything for me. Uh, but she looked good here. She looked really good here. And Io is just... She's awesome right now. Everything she does is clicking. Her heel work is fantastic. They had a really great match. I think it went longer than the 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 title match. So it, it, did. it yeah. So it, that made it feel important as well. That like you're putting these two women who don't really have a, a real storyline against each other, but it's it's a showcase match essentially. And you're 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 going longer than your world title match. So it made that feel even more important um when going into it, it's like okay it's eo against mia yim like what's what's the big thing here uh so i i thought this accomplished a lot and i thought both ladies came out stronger for it yeah i thought this was really good uh eo is fucking awesome yeah she's just so good at like everything she does and um i thought mia yim was really great here actually she um she got some redemption following that flat takeover match with Baszler. And uh, Io and Mia have been actually working a lot on the live events. So it's no surprise that they had a really good match here. Uh, very strong addition to the card because it was a match that was not announced prior. And uh, anytime you add a match and then it uh, definitely delivers, I'm not going to argue. For sure. So got a Tegan Knox video package. She'll be returning to NXT soon. Johnny Gargano versus Shane Thorne was up next. Johnny Gargano won nine minutes via pin. Thought it was a good and entertaining match. I thought uh, Thorne put up a good fight, good effort overall. Uh, Johnny overcame in the end, though, as we all knew he would. Made sense. Gets him on TV, gets him in the mix. It'll be interesting to see how they book him going forward because he's obviously out of the world title mix. Gargano winning was the obvious call. Yeah, where he is going forward is a big thing because he's just he's not in the the title picture. You can always throw him back in the title picture and it'll feel fine because they obviously need four guys against Undisputed Era and Gargano can easily be one of the four. I I'd like to see him kind of I don't know. Gargano, I don't think he's main roster bound because NXT is on the stage that they're on now and we we know he loves NXT. You can always do something, have him work with... And NXT is going to have so many different talents now coming from 205 Live, coming from uh, NXT UK. Like, You know what? Here's what I want. Throw him kind of in that NXT UK title picture. Why, why can't he face Walter? Why can't he face like Kushida? and stuff like nxt uk is it's a dead brand let's be honest it's it's on what thursdays now thursdays at three like they they tape two shows uh um every other month or, or something and by two shows i mean like five or six shows um why can't he be kind of in that mid card stuff and just have really good and fresh matchups with those guys you know you want to see johnny carganto against walter fuck yeah i do so the, I, I think that's kind of where you use Gargano right now. Keep him away from all the titles and just have him be Johnny Wrestling, just going out there and, you know, standing up for the little guy like Kushida. And come on, Kushida and, and Johnny Gargano teaming against uh, Imperium? Sure. I'd watch it. it. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I'm just spitballing for uh ideas for gargano but he's johnny gargano he's always going to be over and they'll they'll always have something for him yeah i wouldn't even be opposed to him um kind of doing like some open challenge stuff like you know like i you know i'm mr takeover i've I've won every title in this company i just want to face you know somebody good and have him face a couple like regular nxt dudes and then like one week fucking pop cesaro or someone in there Start just letting them have some bangers on TV, you know. Man, they they can't bring Cesaro back. That that poor guy he gets brought back, and then we're all excited, and then he goes back to the main roster and he loses a Miz in three minutes. Like, uh, if you're gonna bring Cesaro in, bring him in. I know. I'm still upset over the NXT UK thing. Yeah, it's 
Eh, and it sucks, but the, I hope Cesaro ends up just on NXT. Bring in Cesaro, have him do essentially a, a, a rehash of the Cesaro and Sami Zayn feud, but with Johnny Gargano. There you go. So moving on, uh, NXT Women's Champion Shayna Baszler versus Candice LeRae. Shayna Baszler, death taxes and Shayna Baszler retaining the title in 1450 via submission. <laughs> Every fucking time, Jeremy. I'm just I'm just gonna be wrong for eternity, apparently. I just every time I think she's gonna lose, she wins. Uh I thought they had a very good match. Uh Shayna is great at playing the badass bully really well. Candace is an awesome baby face. Crowd was hot for a potential title change. Uh they worked really hard. Some really nice counter stuff down the end. Uh down the stretch to the end. And uh Baszler retained and at this point, I'm kind of trying to figure out where we're going with this, Jeremy, and I've kind of I'm I'm thinking right now, building up to the real big dog of the World Wrestling Federation, go back to the beginning of the reign of ta- uh, terror of Shayna Baszler, build up Dakota Kai to take the title. Possibly, I, I'm fine with that idea. I love the big dog Dakota Kai, so I'd be. I think that would be great. Um, I, I mean, we both thought Candice was was winning this sh- this match and this title, and then she didn't. And it really is like, oh my God, Shayna Baszler, just keep putting the title, keep this title on this lady. They they love some Shayna Baszler. I wish Paul Heyman would push harder for her. Yeah, um, I I I I think you have to do something. I mean. I know they're pushing NXT as a third brand now and everything, and it is. But the thing is, too, is like, you know, your Raw and SmackDown are your money-making shows. Your big money-making shows. And Shayna Baszler isn't getting any younger. So if you're really going to maximize what you get out of her, I think you have to eventually use her on Raw and SmackDown. And I don't know, man. She's... She's 39. And, you know, not getting any younger. She's had a long MMA career and now in a wrestling career. She's not going to stay healthy forever. And you know how Vince is and Kevin Dunn are with women once they get too old. Plus, Shayna Baszler isn't the Kevin Dunn super hot woman that he likes to have on TV as it is. So it's like, if you're to get something out of her, you got to do it soon. And I'm just kind of wondering if they're ever going to call her up to Raw or SmackDown at this point. It's fine if she doesn't get called up. I mean, if she stays in NXT forever, that's because they are a third brand now. I don't think it's a knock against her. It just feels like she would inject some life into the... um, the women's title scenes on the, those brands because she is she does come across different like she does come across as a Ronda Rousey and she was booked how Ronda Rousey should have been booked from the very start but they they couldn't do that because they wanted Rousey in front of or they didn't do that because they wanted Rousey to be a smiling baby face and you know be presented in front of the media and stuff but Baszler's doing and she's still doing media interviews to, despite the heel persona. So it does feel like you're almost wasting uh, potential, just that crossover MMA angle uh, there. I mean, you could do that with Sonya Deville, but they, they don't seem to have any plans for her. It's okay if Shayna Baszler stays in NXT. I like She's just gone through everyone at this point. And I think that's the, the biggest thing is I no one feels fresh for her and Dakota Kai is certainly uh like the the whole full circle thing makes a lot of sense you've got four four weeks uh five weeks to build Dakota Kai before the takeover um prior to Survivor Series like that's plenty of time to build her she looked good in the the match last week you um you know you keep giving her some some big wins you tell that story there the crowd lo- loves Dakota Kai so so that helps as well you could do that story. I think that at this point makes the most sense because otherwise I, they haven't built anybody up to where I'm like, yeah, she can 
take the title off Shayna unless you're bringing somebody back and le- unless Kyrie's coming back down, which would be great, or Oscar's coming back down, which would be fucking awesome. Yeah, the Oscar thing would be a good story because you could have her coming back to stop, you know, Shayna from beating her title run record and stuff like that. Um, and it would be give Oscar something to do besides being a YouTube gamer. Which yeah. she's really fun at, though, so. Yeah, uh, it, it'd be good, good if Asuka, like, use Asuka. What's wrong with you people? Yeah, and you were talking about Walter and Kushida before. That is official for next week. So Johnny look- Gargano is going to get involved. Hot take, bold prediction. There you go. So looking forward to that. You got that and Gulak and Leo Rush next week, so that'll be a fun time. Pete Dunn versus Danny Birch. Uh, Jeremy, Pete Dunn uh, defeated Danny Birch 715 via pin. Your thoughts? They like Pete Dunn. They should like Pete Dunn. He's awesome. He's he's beating guys, looking good. Johnny Gargano against Pete Dunn. Sure. Just put Johnny Gargano in there with any of these guys. Just let them have good matches. Like, I don't know what their direction is with Pete Dunn. Outside, they just like him and want to get him on these shows. Um, hopefully, you know, the, these wins lead to something. I got attacked by Damian Priest after this, so I guess that's where they're going with Pete Dunn, which is cool. I like Damian Priest. Um, he hasn't been featured a whole, whole lot, but uh, I, I think that's a that's a good feud. Yeah, uh, match was good, obviously. Uh, him and Danny Burch uh, just beat the shit out of each other, which was totally fun, and it felt different than anything else on the show. Uh, Pete Dunn picks up another win, which was good for him, until he got his ass beat by Damian Priest. So, yeah, it's uh, I'm good with that. Um, it, it's a fresh feud, fresh match. So uh, that could be a lot of fun, and uh, I'm actually looking forward to that because I like Damian Priest a lot, too. Yeah, so uh, that should be that should be a fun feud. Uh, Adam Cole was interviewed backstage. He claimed he didn't use his cast to win the match. He's full of shit though and a heel, so that's fine. Undisputed Era shows up to complain about Finn Balor arriving. Cole basically said to forget about him because the focus is on keeping their prophecy fulfilled. And then Wale performed the Street Profits theme to for their entrance, and Full Sail University was all excited and. Okay. I like that. I it showcased that like I like the the special entrance kind of stuff like when Adam Cole got uh wrapped to the ring by Josiah Williams for for takeover. It makes them feel like a bigger deal and coming out through the crowd with Wale, like the the crowd is super into Street Profits. I thought this was a good use of, of Wale and we know he's a big wrestling fan and it made the street profits feel like a, a big deal. Yeah, no, I liked it too. I was just kind of joking. Cause I'm like a 42 year old white guy. So you know, <laughs> oh, Wale, that Wale is a good feller. And no, whale. No, yeah. Yeah. That whale fella. <laughs> no, no, it was, it, it was actually a fun entrance and fucking full sale. Loved it. So, yeah. Like yeah, got over it. Were, over. So uh, that led to our main event, the tag team title match. Jeremy, not the opener as you predicted, but close enough. (laughs) You predicted this would be the opener as well. I know. I I should have. I actually, after we recorded our podcast, like over the the weekend or whenever, I thought about it and I was like, you know what? They're going to headline with the tag team match. And my reasoning was... Uh, the Young Bucks always comment how WWE just doesn't care about tag team wrestling and all that stuff. And I'm like, Triple H is headlining with this fucking tag team match. Yeah. See, uh, you know what? It, it, it makes sense when you, now when you think about it. But like going into the show, I was buying into the tag match uh, opening up, them doing the world title match early because I thought they would do a screwy finish. And then I was convinced they were going to main event with the women and do a title change. So I was just fucking wrong all the way around. <laughs> so I, mean, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, too far behind you. I did have the, the title match not headlining, so I had that one right at least. You did. You at least got the warm-up for the victory lap. Yeah. So, But, uh, yeah, main event, Undisputed Era, defeated the Street Profits in 20 minutes via pin to retain the title. Jeremy, your thoughts? Good match. Uh, it's going to be hard for these two to have a bad match. I didn't 
like it as quite as much as the uh, world title match. And it it was about on the level of Io and, and Mia Yim, which that match ruled. So th- that's not saying... And even the, the Baszler and, and Candice LeRae match. I don't think I talked much about like the, the actual match of that, but that match was, was great as well. Um, so it, it was on that level, which doesn't mean it was bad. It just... Uh, you know, there's so much good wrestling on this night, and this was this was right in line with them. A, a very good wrestling match, and undisputed era won as expected. Crowd loved the match, and you know we got Roderick Strong getting involved, which not too surprising that there would be some undisputed era kind of shenanigans in it. And overall, and I like that. Like you know, it doesn't have to be straightforward clean wins and losses like if you have a dominant heel stable like rick flair wasn't winning every match you know just straightforward clean beating everybody clean as a sheet he would have some help he would he, dirtiest player in the game stuff like the same same with the andersons and and whatnot like the this is how you book a dominant heel stable you get them involved and it it's not directly leading to the finish every single time. It's just, you know, it's a little trick that they're doing to show that, hey, we're trying to keep our titles. We're the dominant group here. We have a numbers advantage. Why shouldn't we use that? So I had no problem with the run in, and I thought this was a, another strong match. Yeah, and the, the thing about the finish, too, is it wasn't like the bullshit that annoys us, like with the Bullet Club, to where it's like, a low blow and five guys run in and hit 18 finishers and then you get a finish. It was basically like Roderick Strong came out and did a distraction for the most part and then that led to the finish. I'm okay with that as long as you don't abuse it and do it all the time and it doesn't get ridiculously over the top. So yeah, I was fine with the the finish. I thought it was a great main event. Uh, Fish and O'Reilly continue to prove why they're one of the best tag teams in wrestling right now. Closing stretch was uh, really outstanding. Uh, Montez Ford, you know, my man, he got the fucking smoke. He did the uh, the big over the post tope. That dude is, unless they fuck it up, that dude is going to be such a fucking star. So good. Yeah, he's he's awesome. And I don't know when they're going to split the Street Profits. Um I would imagine we're going to see them on Raw moving forward. Like they, they've lost twice now to Undisputed Era. They could stay. They're always going to be over with the full cell crowd. But because they've been on Raw so often, I think that they will. And we know Heyman's a big fan of them. I think we'll start seeing them uh, on Raw beginning after the draft. Most likely. That's what I would imagine. So, um, yeah, just uh, really good stuff there. And as I've said before, I'm pretty sure uh, – Genetic engineers are going to want to study the babies of Montez Ford and Bianca Belair in the future. Because <laughs> those are going to be some beautiful, athletically gifted children. Probably uh, born yeah. with abs. Yeah. They're going to be born with abs, Jeremy, I'm telling you. So, post mass They're, they're going to they're gonna be they're going to be injected with the compound V. I guess. Dude. It's going to be crazy. But anyway, post-match, Undisputed Era celebrates on the ramp... And then the bald son of a bitch, Tommaso Ciampa, makes his return. Stares down Adam Cole, looks at his precious Goldie laying on Cole's chest. Shit is officially on, Jeremy. It's... Look, they brought out the big stops for this one. Balor, Ciampa, they've got Ciampa now. Like you, You've got Balor and Ciampa as made contenders for Adam Cole, and those are two matches that make sense. Two ma- Maybe Balor doesn't, but Ciampa certainly does. He never lost the title. Adam Cole has it now. We know that's what Ciampa wants. Great ending to this show. I thought it was just fucking awesome to to see Ciampa back uh, you know it was rumored that he'd been coming back for a few weeks now and to, to save it for for this show was certainly the right call and yeah the NXT you know Ciampa's back in the mix Balor's in the mix now a lot of directions moving forward so overall Jeremy I thought uh I thought NXT was a pretty great show to the shock of nobody uh just really good and consistent show with Good to great wrestling throughout. The two big surprises in Balor and Ciampa. Um, strong foundation moving forward for next week with Walter and Kushida, Gulak and Roosh set. 
Um, so I just, uh, really, really enjoyable show. Had a great time watching NXT. Yeah. The, this NXT, it was a mini takeover and they're not going to do this every week. And that's what I'm kind of telling myself is as good as this show was, like as great as this show was, it's not going to be like this every week. And I hope fans who watch don't be like, Oh, this is what we're getting every week. You're not getting three title matches and, and two big returns every week. They, they did this for a reason and we'll, we'll talk about kind of comparison stuff here in a second, but it's still to NXT on, on most weeks is a, a very good show. I, w- um, yeah, I'll, I'll say that. And then we'll, we'll get into comparisons. Yeah. And that's how we want to kind of move on here. A little, uh, little comparison, AEW versus NXT. Uh, my first take here, Jeremy, is that, uh, Obviously, I still laugh at people that are like, this isn't a war. Quit telling me it's a war. It's not a war. I don't have to choose. Okay, no, no. Nobody's telling you about choosing. But if you don't think this is a fucking war right now, NXT went all out their first week with a mini takeover versus AEW. Not only did they book a mini takeover with three title matches... They brought in Finn Balor and added him to the brand. They brought back Tommaso Ciampa. Do not tell me WWE does not see this as a warrant that they did not go all out to try to win week one versus AEW. Now, conversely, what I found very interesting is AEW went out and felt like they were just running their show. This is our show tonight. We're not going to go overboard. We're not going to blow through a lot of booking. We're not going to hot shot a lot of stuff. We're going to try to put on a good wrestling debut show. And I thought they did. Overall, Jeremy, I do think that I I enjoyed NXT a little more. And I would give them the nod in week one. But I also respect the fact that AEW didn't try to blow their load just because NXT came out full guns blazing week one. Cause I Cody's, don't, go ahead. I was going to say, because I don't think you can think that way. I, as I keep saying, I've said it for years with, with Impact and other companies. You have to focus on you. You have to build up whatever the fuck AEW is going to be going forward. You have to settle on an identity, you have to lay out a plan, and you have to move forward with that. And you can't be concerned with pulling an Eric Bischoff and sitting in the back of a monitor and, oh shit, NXT's doing this, so we need to do that. Don't do that. You need to be AEW first and foremost, find your identity, stick with it, and just do that going forward. Because that's kind of what people want. They want you to have your own identity. They want something new. They want to try something new. They want something new they can invest in. They want something they feel is not going to insult their intelligence like Raw or SmackDown do a lot of weeks. They want something that feels special. Give them that. Cody said um, that they're not going to be a reactionary brand. And... I think that really showed in this first episode because if they wanted to be reactionary, like the moment uh, NXT announced Cole and Gargano or Cole and um, Riddle was opening the show, they could have been like, oh, Cody and Guevara might not be the best match to open with. Let's open with Pac Pac and Hangman because we know that's going to be a great match with with big stakes Um, and and two well-known guys. Like Sammy Guevara is not well-known compared to uh, Pac Pac and Hangman. Uh, They didn't do that. They, you know, they didn't. You know that long segment uh, with the the tag team stuff. Instead of shifting that around, like they should have that that's not even a reactionary call. That should have just been shifted around regardless. But they they didn't shift that around because they they saw what was going on on the other show or anything like that. They dynamite felt like the first show in a long series. Like it, it felt like all right. We're, we're giving you this we're in this for the long haul we you know everything we we do tonight we're not just here to to pop you pop this rating whatever it is 
this is episode one of a, of a series that is lasting for 20 seasons or, or whatever. Like, like that's what you're getting. And NXT, I mean, let's be honest. We know why they did this show. They, they booked a mini takeover. They booked three title matches. They had Finn Balor return. They had Ciampa return. They pulled out all these stops for this show to get you to not watch AEW. Was it the right call? I don't know. I like, you know, the stuff they did made sense. And it's certainly like we know NXT is in it for the long haul as well. And they're going to, um, you know, the, they booked plenty of stuff coming out of this show as well. It's not like it's just, it was the conclusion to everything. It was also the start of, of many different programs and whatnot. But I think my, my problem with, with NXT's philosophy on this is, and I said it last week, if they lose the ratings this week, it's going, it's not going to look great because I don't know if NXT can put on a show that can top what they did on Wednesday. And if more people still decided to watch AEW, then like what, where do you go from here? It's almost like they would have been better off knowing this is AEW's first show, knowing they are going to have this buzz and, and th- this curiosity around them to just be like, we will give you just kind of a middling show. And if we lose, it's like, OK, you know, we didn't give you everything we got here. And we we knew AEW. Like It's almost like they tried too hard to pull viewers from AEW and maybe that's not the best idea for AEW's first show with the buzz going in. And I do think that AEW is going to win when when the ratings come out later today. The the buzz I saw seemed to be way more for AEW on my timeline. Every report I've read seems to have AEW uh, ahead of NXT. Like I don't know how you, how your coverages did for comments um uh, or the 411 coverage when it came to, to comments and, and views and whatnot. But from other sites, AEW was way ahead and Google Trends was way ahead for AEW. Does this, all this translate to, to ratings? Not necessarily. It's usually good for pay-per-view buys, but I don't know how much it all translates to, to ratings. But AEW, the, the buzz was so big for this show that – NXT giving you pulling out all these stops just makes you feel like, all right, you did all of this. You still lost. Like now what else can you do? Yeah. Um, regarding the, the, the buzz and traffic and stuff. Yeah. The AEW stuff did big business, uh, last night. Um, we, it did, uh, like raw level, um, comments, uh, just like pay per view level comments as well at times uh, for the live coverage, just uh, a lot of buzz and like you talked about the I was checking the Google Trend stuff too. It was big on that. Uh, like an hour before the show, it was trending on Twitter and it trended all throughout and for a couple hours afterwards, uh, like top trend. Uh, and again, is that going to translate to TV ratings? Because it all the social media stuff doesn't always translate into money. It doesn't translate into ratings all the time, but it seemed buzz wise and interest wise and everything that, yeah, it was the hotter show. So I am, I am fascinated because it's Thursday morning right now. Uh, ratings are going to be out in about five hours, Jeremy. So I'm going to be fascinated to see when they come out just to, just to see if the, the WWE strategy paid off or to see if the buzz of week one for AEW was enough to overtake that. Um, real quick, uh, what did you overall? What show did you think was better for this week? I thought NXT was better. Um, they they had the they had the best match. I, my favorite match on the entire night was Riddle against Cole. They had the bigger surprises. I mean, Balor and Ciampa returning is a better surprise than Jake Hagar. Uh, and as far as just angles and stuff, I, I think both both companies did well with, with angles. But NXT was, you could tell they'd produced television before um, 
because there was no real dead spots like there was with the the AEW show and like that is a knock against AEW the the things AEW did better were their I like their commentary team better and it felt bigger uh, we we know NXT is in full sale in 400 uh, people. It's it's not a big arena. It's intimate, but on television, it doesn't look like it's this grandiose stage. Whereas you're watching AEW, it felt like a big time show. So uh, AEW had the advantage there. But just watching as a wrestling show for this week, NXT was better. That's not a knock on AEW. Their show was great. If you listen to this review. Exactly, I agree. Uh, and yeah, my next point was, uh, first of all, I thought both crowds were great tonight. Uh, they added a lot to the shows, which is always important. Um, AEW, in comparison, looked big time. Uh, they're running a building. They have 14,000 people there. The crowd's hot all night. They did a really good job of capturing the crowd on TV, too, with like the wide-spanning shots and the pullouts and yes. stuff. Uh, to really kind of encapsulate how big that crowd was. So I thought they did a great job there. And again, in comparison to the 400 and full sale, again, the 400 and full sale were hot for the whole show. But this was like a really weird, rare instance of WWE not looking big time. And people were to go, well, it's not WWE, it's NXT. It's the same fucking company, okay? I, I, you guys say that all the time when it fits your narrative. So it's just it now listen it doesn't matter to me if you put on a good show and you have a good crowd I don't care if it's 800 or 8000 okay but if you're a casual fan flipping around and you flip on NXT and let's say you don't know anybody on either show you are a, just a casual fan out there and like you you occasionally like to watch the grappling and you click over and there's NXT and, you know, it's like, oh, it's a hot crowd. That looks okay. And then, like, I know a lot of people have said that uh, on their cable or satellite that uh, USA and TNT are right next to each other. So you're on USA and you're watching. Like, oh, that's okay. And then you decide to click up on a commercial. It goes screen and screen and you're going to click up and see what's on. And you click up and AEW's on. And you have this crowd going ape shit, and they're panning out to 14,000 people, and it looks really cool, and it feels really big time. If you're that fan that's not, like, dedicated to one show, you may want to check out that other show because it feels bigger. It has a bigger scope. So, I, I again, I don't know how it's going to play to a regular person. And like I said, again, to me doesn't really matter. I, I Like I said, I enjoyed the NXT show a little more than the AEW show this week. I thought both were very good. I enjoyed the hell out of my Wednesday night. Had a great time. And again, I don't care if it's 400 or 14,000. As long as you have a good show and a hot crowd, I'm happy. But I will say... Who do you say, think... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, if NXT starts losing the ratings battle... And let's say they consistently lose the ratings battle. I guarantee you that Vince will get them out of full sale as soon as possible. Because he will blame it on the fact that the other show looks bigger. He won't admit that the other show is better. But in his mind, he will feel that they don't look big enough because they're running that little building. And he will try to get them out of there. That is my prediction if that happens. I'm not saying AEW is going to go on a WCW 83 week run or any bullshit like that. I'm just telling you what I know about Vince McMahon and how he thinks. So if for some reason AEW starts whooping their ass for repeated weeks in the ratings, I can see Vince getting them out of full so as soon as possible. I'm with you, and that would be the the dangling carrot there. Um, that you know they they need to get into a bigger arena. They I mean they've they've sold tickets through for full sale through December, so I would imagine the earliest that they're they would move would, would be in 2020. Uh, it, it's not even a question of like is this show better and. and because I mean, I think NXT is going to be consistently very good every week, just like I think AEW is going to be consistently very good every week. And they're 
I think there's going to be a lot of weeks where, as far as general consensus is, yeah, AEW was better this week, NXT was better this week. Like, I think they're going to be flipping back and forth as far as uh, critical opinion on both shows. I don't think it's going to be a thing where well, AEW smoked them this week, and it's going to be like that every single week. But when it comes to ratings, that matters more than just critical opinion. Um, that just is what it is, and. The thing NXT does have that they could do bigger and better is a bigger and better arena. And, you know, we'll we'll see if they go that way. If AEW starts to win the win the ratings, who do you think uh, wins in week one? The ratings. I, I, I'm I feeling AEW right now just because like the buzz was really big all day Wednesday long. Traffic was up, uh, you know, the, like we talked about Google Analytics and stuff. It's just, uh, I mean, I, it feels like AEW, and I might be deadly wrong. But again, it's so hard to predict with this company, Jeremy, because they've done so many things that they shouldn't have done. They they shouldn't have sold 100,000 pay-per-views twice with no TV. They shouldn't have sold out Vegas in four minutes. You know, I mean, for, for all I know, I mean, this company is going to totally overachieve and pull like a 1.5 million viewers for this debut show. And a bunch of people are going to be silly for their t-shirt company jokes. <laughs> I, 1.5 sounds like, like a good number to me. And, and maybe I'm being like way too optimistic because I don't, like I, I, I fully admit I don't know what ton about television ratings outside of what i see for um wrestling every week and wrestling every week is is kind of skewed differently than than a lot of other uh television shows and whatnot but i know viewership just pretty much across the board is falling like you look at ratings for a lot of popular shows nowadays compared to where they were at the beginning like it's just or even a year ago like the numbers just aren't there. But the buzz was I, I wonder if we're almost caught in a wrestling bubble to where the buzz is very big for AEW online. We we know that. We definitely know that. That that is their biggest fan base is people who watch the show online. Um and you know, social media and stuff like this is why they do so well on social media. You know, is that going to translate to the television viewers? And I don't know if that's all gonna be the case because if you look at like an award show like an award show always has like a ton of buzz online and stuff but award shows are getting some of their lowest ratings ever because people just they're they're not that into like the casual people just aren't that into award shows but the the ones that are going to watch watch and are very vocal about what they like and what they don't like i'm on one hand, I'm very excited for five hours from now when these ratings come out and we, we get a sense of how many wrestling fans there are out there on Wednesday nights watching both of these products. On the other hand, I'm deathly afraid because the Twitter is just going to be a toxic Fucking hell cesspool. hole. It, yeah. yeah I it's... know. I'm, I'm not looking forward <laughs> to the comments section of my own website, Jeremy, because I just... It, if AEW for some reason does badly... You're going to have all these guys doing their victory lap. Oh, look at all the spot monkeys that fucking failed and all that shit. And it's just going to be the worst ever. Uh, Like I said, man, it's so hard to predict what AEW is going to do. I mean, like that that one hour countdown special did 640,000 viewers, which is really good for a one hour show that wasn't really promoted all that much. So it's like, that's really encouraging. And there's been a ton of AEW commercials I've seen on TV, uh, including like during the baseball playoffs and stuff like that. So it's like, I just, it feels like there's a lot of buzz, but like you said, maybe we are in the bubble and maybe we're deathly wrong. And again, like I also said, going back a couple weeks, it's so hard to predict with this company. I mean, they could totally underachieve and do like 200,000 viewers or they could do a million. It's so hard to gauge because everything they've done so far has just been stuff that shouldn't have been done in the traditional wrestling sense. 
So I'm fascinated to see how they do week one. Yeah, week week one's going to be interesting. And as I have always said, I'm more curious about what the ratings are in December because that'll show staying power. That'll show consistency and that matters more than what you're going to do week one. I, I'm I'm fascinated with week one though because of the show NXT put on and the the fact that they went complete balls to the wall to try to counter AEW. And if that doesn't work, we know WWE is a reactionary brand. The like the whole NXT move on some level is reactionary. How do they react if they if they lose week one and with the show they put on? So Shit, I almost feel like we need to record after the ratings come out, but we'll maybe we'll discuss that off the air. Oh yeah, all I gotta say is yeah. If, if for some reason AEW strings off a couple weeks, get ready for the big dog on NXT. <laughs> Roman Gonna Reigns have, will save the day. They're gonna get the Rock somehow on <laughs> NXT. Like, come on, Rock, come down to Orlando. Your daughter's training here at the Port Performance Center. Come check her out. How does Wednesday work for you to come give her a look and give her some advice and maybe stick around Wednesday night? Yeah, um, Tamina and uh, Nia will be there. We'll, we'll, we'll buy you dinner. Come on down, <laughs> Dwayne. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll watch Hobbs and Shaw together. We'll yeah, they're. They're going to get Austin on there, <laughs> to Triple A. They're going to do a DX reunion tour oh, on the God, show and no. everything. We know Michaels and shit, the, the Hall and Nash were at the show last night. We know Michaels and Hunter are there every week, so the Xbox there most weeks. So, yeah, they'll just do a whole click thing. Uh I I think Cody commented like if you become reactionary then you're like oh the Undertaker teams with Johnny Gargano that's what <laughs> that's Johnny Gargano's next move. Oh yeah. Uh yeah, it's going to be really interesting and um I, also to go back real quick before we move on to like what you said last week. It's going to be interesting to see what audience does NXT retain the million viewers. Did they actually grow past 1.1? Did they drop underneath? How much did AEW do? I mean, it, I, I'm going to be like totally fascinated if for some reason, like both shows did a million viewers. Like I'll be amazed and like really happy actually. Yeah. But, the, but I'm this just, is, it's fascinating go, because we haven't, we haven't had something like this for the longest time, Jeremy. And for people that are downplaying it, I'm sorry. This is, this was the biggest night in wrestling since the end of the Monday Night Wars. And I'm sorry, I don't count TNA trying to run Monday Night because that ended up a colossal failure and something that highly damaged the company in the long run. Yeah, the the buzz for TNA trying Monday Night was nothing like uh, the the buzz for AEW. And I remember even like being excited. I, social media gives it a, a different feel granted um social media wasn't as big when tna tried to go on monday nights and, and reignite that war and i think like if aew had tried to go up against raw i i don't even think it would be quite as big because like raw has their built-in fan base i don't think aew is going to do i guess it was, still would have been fascinating okay we know raw does about two million viewers if aew goes on monday night does that knock raw down to 1.8 1.7 7 million viewers or something but going up against nxt feels you know more doable as as competition for them right out of the gate it, it's certainly bigger than than what tna tried to do um I, I'm, I'm with you on. We know just over a million fans watch wrestling on Wednesday nights. A or NXT has created that base over uh, the last two weeks, and so like we talked about in the preview, do does it stay at that? Like, do we see a 50-50, 500 split? Is it you know sixty forty, or do we see like an increase where AEW does one point five and NXT still does a million, and it's like shit. There's two point five million fans. Like, there's more fans watching wrestling on Wednesday night than there are watching just Raw on on Monday night. So that's also what I'm interested in is we're going to get a a strong base of what of kind of how many wrestling fans there are that are actually out there. And I will say this 
to kind of pump the brakes a little bit on the the viewership numbers the these shows did go up against uh opening night nhl and i know people are gonna be like oh hockey that nobody watches that fucking sport look it's it's opening night they're they're sports fans so uh, hockey fans are wrestling fans too um so that that could potentially lose some viewers and it did go up against the wild card baseball game again it, it's a sports game and it's uh an important sports game because it's uh, a baseball playoff game so i don't know if this is even like super indicative of all of the or it is indicative but i don't know if it even gives you like the full scope of how many wrestling fans there actually are out there watching because i'm sure there are wrestling fans who decided to watch hockey or baseball um just because you can re-watch wrestling uh on the dvr easier than you can re-watch um hockey and, and baseball because you're just more likely to be spoiled by the outcome and i don't know about anybody else but if i'm spoiled by a sporting outcome like hockey baseball football basketball i'm probably not going to watch the thing if i'm spoiled by a wrestling match if it's a good match i'll still go back and watch it yeah fair enough and uh Again, I'm just I'm really interested and again, don't don't do victory dances or, you know, dance on someone's grave after week 1, guys. It's you have to we need 6 to 8 weeks of data before we can really do anything. So, AEW week 1 going to be interesting. And, and again, going forward, do not expect a mini takeover every week from NXT cuz that's not happening. No, expect more if they keep losing ratings. <laughs> Yeah, expect a mini SmackDown every week. The Undertaker. <laughs> so, uh, speaking of SmackDown and The Undertaker and stuff like that, SmackDown moves to Fox on Friday night. Jeremy, they got a pretty big show lined up. This is the beginning of the five-year, one billion dollar deal, which uh, is not only going to open up WWE to possibly higher viewership thanks to being on network TV and the synergy with Fox, which Fox has been really great at actually pushing this show so far, but also makes WWE even more financially secure and dominant in the wrestling world. We've talked about that a lot. Another reason they're locking people like Jinder Mahal and the Canellas is up to $500,000 a year contracts. So, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I, I don't know. Like, yeah, they, they were able to, all the SmackDown money led to them paying a lot of wrestlers which good for those guys that's right all that sweet fox money mixed in with that saudi blood money you can do a lot of damage so um we're gonna go ahead and do a quick preview here we got uh charlotte and becky lynch versus bailey and sasha banks we saw this match at madison square garden like it's gonna be a good match all four of these women are very good professional wrestlers and they'll probably get a, a good amount of time so It'll be fun. It'll be exciting. I, I hope they get a, a fair amount of time. Like this, this match can't headline for obvious reasons. I I don't know what they're gonna kick it off with. I feel like you should. You're probably gonna kick it off with The Rock because that just would seem to make the most sense. But if you're gonna kick it off with a match, like this would be the match I would go with right out of the gate. Um, you're you're gonna showcase your your four women of the now and, and of the future to the people who are immediately tuning in. Yeah, um, I wouldn't doubt that they kick off with this. Um, if they kick off with The Rock, see, I don't, I think that's a bad idea because they did that a couple weeks ago with Austin, and then like the audience really dwindled throughout the show because like everybody's like, oh, well, we saw Austin at the beginning. So if you tease The Rock deeper into the show, I think you have a better chance for a better rating. The one thing about this show is like this show has gotten a lot of hype, and they haven't built like anything for Hell in a Cell. And we're going to talk about that next. but So it leads me to believe that this match will probably be used to book a Charlotte versus uh, Bailey rematch. So I'm going to have Charlotte and Becky Lynch winning this match because Becky and Sasha will probably take each other out and brawl to the back. Charlotte will beat Bailey, setting up the rematch. That makes sense. So, uh, we got the big dog Roman Reigns versus Eric Rowan. Jeremy, your thoughts? 
do a screwy finish maybe like roman roman will probably win they'll put him over strong and that that'll be that because rowan beat him on the pay-per-view with the the help of harper but i could see some type of like screwy smosh with harper and, and brian getting involved to add some extra heat to the tag team match this match feels completely unnecessary it does because you have the tag match coming up at the pay-per-view and they already did have a singles match, uh, Extreme Rule, or what, not Extreme Rules, Class Night Champions, whatever the fuck it was. Anyway, they had a match, and, like, I don't really see the need to do this. If anything, they probably should have ran, like, Roman versus Harper, or Brian versus Harper, or something. Uh, mix it up. I don't think the rematch makes sense, but I'm going for no clean finish here in my preview. Um, probably just to build heat on the tag match. Plus, I don't think either guy really should lose before the um, before the pay per view. Doesn't make any sense to me. Roman's winning. Well, the big dog always wins, Jeremy. It's the way it is. A career versus career ladder match. The second best in the world behind Shane Taylor, Shane McMahon versus Kevin Owens, Jeremy. It'll be fun. Shane will do some big ass bump that people freak out about and it gets played on all the Fox Sports highlight shows and stuff, which I mean that's what he's here for, right? Logic says Kevin Owens wins and we never have to see Shane McMahon again. But there's the WWE logic that says Shane McMahon wins and Kevin Owens just continues his career on Raw or NXT. Yeah, I am. Um, Kevin Owens should win. And hopefully they use this as a way to write off Shane as the authority figure character and just get rid of the authority figures altogether. I'm fine with Regal and NXT because he's barely ever around. That's fine. And he does a good job when he's there. Uh, Drake Maverick is pretty much gone from 205 Live. He hasn't done anything GM-worthy in forever. And uh, Johnny Saint is kind of alive in NXT UK, but Sid Scala, I think, is trying to murder him and take his place. Because <laughs> Johnny Saint is, like, never around and they don't let him talk. So that's fine, too. But, yeah, hopefully this will be um, a way to get rid of Shane and authority figures altogether. Because we don't need them, and they're totally fucking cliché. Kevin Owens should win. Hopefully it's good and fun. But yes, will, please go ahead. Will the boss man raise the briefcase? Well, you know what? That would be a hell of a fucking trick. <laughs> considering he's dead. <laughs> I know, but it'd be a good callback. Who, who would. would be who is the 2019 version of the pig boss man? Roman Reigns in his flat jacket. Uh, I mean, boss man was never yeah, I guess looks wise, um, who's like on that level that could just help Drew McIntyre? Drew McIntyre is gonna Elias. raise Elias. Yeah, Elias. Elias it would, it would be uh, a good one. So yeah, they'll they'll raise the briefcase. I'm with you on the authority thing. Like you can do them as just table setters and you know guys who announce matches and or you burst into their office kind of like complaining about and they're like okay i'll give you this whatever you need to earn this they don't need to be like taking up 15 minutes of promo time and, and wrestling on every pay-per-view like that's not how you should be using authority figures the regal what drake maverick was doing i guess he did have the match with mike nellis and, and sid scala like even sid scala is i guess wrestling now regal just follow the regal formula do you, you want to hear a sad statistic, Jeremy? Shane McMahon has wrestled more matches on WWE TV in 2019 than Asuka. Yeah, I believe it. I'd never see Asuka. <laughs> Shane that's, McMahon's probably wrestled like two matches on WWE TV, and that's more than Asuka. Yeah, just like TV and pay-per-view all together. It's, it's a sad state of affairs. So It's not good, but yeah. So hopefully Kevin Owens wins and we end this madness. And I think it would be great at the end too is after he wins and he fires Shane that the Miz comes out and beats the fuck out of Shane to finally get his revenge. <laughs> sure. Miz needs something to just not look like a complete geek, but so sure. Yeah, he got he he was bitch made in that feud, horrible. 
the big main event gimmick of the show, Jeremy, is WWE Champion Kofi Kingston battling Brock Lesnar, Jeremy. What's going all, on? All signs point to Brock Lesnar just winning the title, and I'm completely okay with that. Like, Kofi's run, we, we talked about it in previously, but Kofi's run wasn't going to last forever. Brock is the perfect guy to take the title off of him. Brock gives you that sports credibility that Fox is reportedly looking for. It'll probably a good, be a good match because – uh, Kofi will bump his ass off and Brock just tosses dudes around and it's awesome. I've seen some people say like, oh, Rey Mysterio and Dominic are going to come out and cost Brock the match. That would be stupid. Just just have Brock win. Yeah, I, I think it's time to end the Kofi run. Uh, we Like you said, we've talked about this a lot. And I don't want to beat the dead horse, but Kofi's story was great. It was a great chase. It resulted in a great WrestleMania moment. The title run has been flat as hell. The matches have just been there. Kofi's a guy that unfortunately was just way better in the chase than as the actual champion. And there's nothing wrong with that because some guys just aren't meant to be champion or champion for a long time. I'm really glad he got his moment. It was a great moment. And for as much as the Brock stuff frustrates me, it feels like the right call at this time with... The big debut on Fox and everything going on. It just feels like the right time to put the title on him. I think doing a disputed finish and rematch of Hell in a Cell would be a horrible idea. Because you don't want to fuck up that first night on Fox. You want to try to do everything as correct as possible to get a big rating and hope that you can continue that going forward. So I am also going with Brock. And I kind of hope that they redo the the Brock-John Cena SummerSlam match. That would be fine. I'm I'm fine with... There's just plenty of ways you can book this. Any way you book it, though, Brock should be going over. And like we know Brock can have these good matches, though, especially with these smaller guys who he's excited to work with. I don't know if he's excited to work with Cody, but he's usually excited to work with these smaller guys. Cody, and what company are you talking about now? Kofi, sorry. Uh, maybe he'd be excited to work with Cody. Who knows? Um, Cody would get a huge fucking reaction. Um... And now I've lost my train of thought. Uh, but he likes working with these smaller guys because they, they bump their asses off for him. And he appreciates that. And he's willing to give in return and, you know, sell their offense in a in a big way to where it's like, oh, shit, this move might actually take him down. So I think it'll be a good match. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I just have one, one, one bit of advice for Kofi. Attack the itis. Attack the diverticulitis. <laughs> It's a weakness. Hit him with that liver kick. That's right. So, uh, yeah, that is the big uh, SmackDown on Fox debut. Live coverage is always on 411 on uh, Friday night, Jeremy. And uh, we're going to close up by talking a little WWE Hell in a Cell. And by a little, I mean a little because with all this Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We've got to talk about The Rock's return. All right, we'll talk about The Rock's return. I, look, I'm excited for The Rock's return. I I usually hate nostalgia returns because like Hogan and Flair was stupid on Raw and Austin, like I, I'm a big Stone Cold fan, but he's been showing up so much lately that it's like, all right, it loses some of its effect. Like The Rock hasn't been on TV for since I think WrestleMania 32. He doesn't, he hasn't been on SmackDown in forever what do you think The Rock does? You think he just cuts a promo? I've I heard some people say that he wants to work with Becky Lynch. What do you think The Rock does? Uh, I'd imagine a promo. I, I I think something with Becky could possibly be fun. Um, I'd laugh if he came back just to get revenge on Eric Rowan or just to rub it in his face from that little WrestleMania uh, 30 second match they had at that one mania. Uh, maybe maybe The Rock helps Roman Reigns. <laughs> Against Eric Rowan, because that's the story that needs to be told. That's right. <laughs> the the big dog brought in the real big guns to help him. Yeah. So I don't know. I just expect them to give Rock ten minutes to go out and do the Rock promo and basically play the hits and make everybody chant and maybe sing a song. That's probably what they'll end up doing. I hope he does do a, a thing with 
a current star and puts them over not instead of burying them um because i mean the rock's gonna truck anybody on the mic but you put him out there with becky lynch he puts over uh becky and like that that looks good and then i don't know sasha interrupts and then that leads to the tag match or something i i just hope they they obviously give the rock time on his own because he's the fucking rock and that's what people want to see so somebody's segment is getting cut though i'm telling you right now rock you can tell him he's got 10 minutes he's fucking going out there for as long as he wants and ain't nobody telling him to, uh, to wrap it up yeah pretty much and you know that's but yeah just kind of let rock go out there and play the hits because again that's what that's what people want they want him to go out there and uh, i think you need to have lillian garcia on this show just, yeah just so he can talk about uh you know, the, eating pie and uh, do the whoa boy gimmick at Lillian and stuff, and because that uh, that was always funny stuff. And fucking have Coachman appear and make have him make Coach dance, and I don't know, just fucking let the Rock be the Rock and do his shit, and just because, like you said, he he hasn't been there in forever, and that's what people want to see. They they don't want to see the Rock doing anything stupid. They just want to see the Rock being the Rock. And yeah, it'd be nice if he did something with a current member of the roster and actually kind of put him over a bit. Um, unlike a couple years ago when he popped in and basically said he wanted to fuck Lana and make made Rusev look like an idiot. And then everybody said, oh, they're so much more over now because they worked with the Rock. No, the Rock came in and said he was going to fuck Lana and then made Rusev look like an idiot and then he left. Okay? Didn't help anybody. But like you said, you, think- you can't just have anybody come out and do a promo with The Rock because they're going to get smoked. Do you think uh, he calls CM Punk? Oh, Christ. Who the fuck? <laughs> Again, he's The Rock. He'll do whatever the fuck he wants. I, I, I'd actually kind of chuckle if he did, but I doubt it. I I think... I don't... I think Punk is done wrestling, but because he's in the headlines and everything this week... I think they announced Punk for the Fox show on on this show, the the WWE backstage studio show. I, I think he's announced for that on the show. I don't know if he appears in front of the live audience or whatever, but I think they make the announcement here. I think if he is confirmed for the show, they should announce it because they're probably going to have a really big uh, audience Friday night, especially with Rock being there. It's the debut. Uh, I It makes the most sense to announce it, yeah. So uh, if he is set, that would be a good deal to make. Get it out there in front of that audience, and uh, hopefully people will watch that show then. Yeah, I, one issue is that it doesn't debut until November 5th, so oh. it has a, a full month. Yeah, it's 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 got a little while, so maybe you hold off and do it closer, but this is going to be their, their largest audience, so why not just do it now? And then people are going to want to see CM Punk in the ring if he's on this uh, studio show, though. But I think Punk gets played into here somehow. There, there's too much smoke to these rumors, and, and he confirmed it himself. He did on-screen testing. And, like, it, if he wants the job, and it sounds like he, he does, because otherwise why would he even entertain the offer, uh, it's his. They're, they're not going to say, eh, no, I don't think so. Like, they, they understand what, what he brings if they hire him compared to if they hired literally anybody else. Fair enough. Are you happy that we talked about The Rock now? Yeah, The Rock fucking rules, dude. You're not excited about The Rock? I, I am, but I just... Uh... I, I sometimes get, like, really trepidatious when these guys come back. Because everybody gets all upset with me. It's like, like, I enjoyed the last Steve Austin appearance. And I said it was a good segment. But I made an offhand comment that pissed everybody off. Because I said, the only drawback to this segment is that it's impossible for AJ to get his heat back. Because he can't touch Austin. And they're never yeah. going to do anything. And I didn't say that the segment sucked. I didn't say that AJ was buried. All I said was the downfall to segments like this are guys like AJ can never get their heat back. It's like when anybody works with Stephanie. They're never going to get one up on Stephanie. Unless it's that once a year WrestleMania bump she takes. This is why you don't 
you know, you don't have him truck or bury anybody. You you do uh, essentially the the Cena act where where Cena came out with uh for SmackDown earlier this year and and Becky did the segment with him and then they they did the match. I mean, yeah, did Becky uh Cena beat Andrade, but but Becky actually won that match. So Cena didn't actually like beat anybody. Uh, and then Cena came out with the Usos and did like the the rapping gimmick and and that was cool. So like, you do something. Like that, you you have him put over a person like Becky or, I mean, Roman, you don't need to go to that well again. But if they wanted to, you could do that. Like have him hang out with the New Day, like so, something like that. Like The Rock is a fun baby face. So you put him in there with another baby face and have the baby face get over instead of just running over somebody. Yeah, no, I agree. And hopefully... Hopefully they they don't do that like the the wrong thing you know I just you know let the rock go out and be the rock for ten minutes and let everybody be happy and don't bury anybody in the process have him grab the camera and do his own reaction shots the rock started the reaction shots that have crippled all wrestling companies fair enough so yeah I I am I am excited I just hope they handle it correctly. So now we will move on to talk a little bit about <laughs> the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view because it's Thursday, Jeremy. We are three days away from this pay-per-view or whatever. There are three matches announced. Yeah, That's we're it. getting a mystery card. I don't know what you're complaining about. WWE <laughs> Mystery Vortex L of PWG. Yeah, the, the, that's what we're getting here. I'm excited. You, you know, it's a random match generator. It feels like the ECW December to Dismember card when there was like two matches announced the morning of that show and then they just filled it out with random bullshit. Uh, pretty much. I mean, that show turned out well, right? Sure. I mean, Paul Heyman was fired and... <laughs> I think bar. they'll like they'll they'll have some matches announced coming out of SmackDown, and then they'll announce some shit on Saturday. I hope they don't. I hope they just go into the show three matches announced. Like you can get away with this stuff in the network era, where if you tried to pull this shit with trying to sell pay per views, you know, no one's buying the this. I mean, maybe they still buy it because the top two matches are really strong, but it, it would be a tougher sell. Like in the network era. Like people are going to fucking watch and I'm honestly almost more anticipating this than if I knew oh cool we're we're getting the new day against the revival for the 500th time don't get me wrong it's a very good match but it's like I've seen this oh awesome we're getting AJ and Cedric again again very good match I've seen it a billion times the fact that I'm going into this show and I don't know what I'm getting I'm more excited than just random rematch number 13 for the month yeah, uh, it's just it just feels so weird that it's this card has been totally forgotten in this week with the Raw season premiere and the big NXT two hour premiere and the big Fox move. It's just like, oh, yeah, we we got a pay per view this week. Yeah, we might want to announce some stuff. I guess I don't know. Hey guys, what do you think? Well, we got three matches. That's okay. <laughs> it's like. It's the weirdest thing, but yeah, so start off, Jeremy, Roman Reigns and Daniel Bryan versus Luke Harper and Eric Rowan. Uh, I hope Harper and Rowan win. I don't think they will, but I, I generally dislike thrown together tag team beats established tag team. Um, and I know Reigns and Bryan are like two of the best singles guys in the company, but I, I just don't like that whole gimmick and like Harper and Rowan were former champions and everything. Uh, like they've been together forever. Reigns and Brian were trying to kill each other two weeks ago. So why are they Roman and Brian are going to win? It'll, it'll probably be good. All four of these guys are good and it, it'll be, I, I can't say they'll get time. I don't know who's going to get time on this fucking show, but it'll probably well, be right a good now. Match. Everybody's getting a fucking hour. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Every match is going an hour. <laughs> Going fucking Broadway's baby. Yeah, though so it'll be a good match. Yeah, I am. Um, I, I think it will be a good match. I, Rowan has stepped up and delivered so far in his little singles run here. 
Uh, he recently had a good match with Brian. He had a good match with Roman. We all know Luke Harper's really good. Uh, I think the real thing here is going to be the story of Daniel Bryan. Um, is is Daniel Bryan back to being a good wrestle lad? Is is he going to be Roman Reigns' buddy and be a good tag team partner? Or is he going to pull the old Ole Anderson on Dusty Rhodes, the uh, the fake face turn to where he acts like a good guy and then turns on Reigns and it was all an elaborate plan because he always hated Reigns and was willing to do anything and sacrifice anything just to take him out because he's a son of a bitch. Or is Brian going to be Nikita Koloff going into the uh, the war games? The dastardly heel, the foreigner, the turned baby face, who everybody doubted. And then, you know, he saw the light, he got in the cage, and then he fucking wrecked fools for the baby faces, and everything was good. So I do like the layers to the match, honestly. And once we got past the whole, we had someone trying to kill kill Roman Reigns thing, it's actually been good after we got past that. Probably be a good match. Uh, I'm kind of looking forward to it, thinking it has potential. I am going to go with Harper and Rowan. I hope Ray, or Brian remains a heel. I think he's been great as this heel run. Um, and, you know, he says he's yeah, he's called it Rowan the superior intellectual and everything, but he always said, like, I'm smarter, I'm still smarter, and this would show, like, like I'm still smarter. Like, I used Rowan to use himself to, to beat me, to beat you. Uh, it's almost convoluted, but not. Um, Daniel Bryan is playing uh, 40 chess, which makes sense for the Daniel Bryan character. Uh, so I hope... I hope he remains a heel and he, uh, Roman is the, the sting in this regard. Yeah. I, I'd kind of like to see that too. So we'll see what happens. Uh, probably good match though. Raw women's title match. Hell in the cell champion, Becky Lynch versus Sasha Banks. Jeremy. I think you got to go Sasha here. It'll again another match that it's going to go an hour and it should be excellent. Cause both of these ladies rule. They're going to, pull out all the stops with the the weapons and stuff. I think this will be more of a kind of your your violent hell in a cell than the fiend against uh Rollins will be. Um but th- this should be another great match and Sasha should win. I don't think you can quite beat her too early. Becky's not going to lose anything in losing. And plus with Becky most likely going to SmackDown considering how much they they've pushed her in all of the ads. Uh, you know, you got to take the, the raw women's title off of her. So Sasha winning would make a lot of sense. Yeah, completely agree there. I, I think you have to go with Sasha right now. It makes the most sense. Um, and then we're going to move on to our, I, I guess what will be our main event. I mean, only three matches on the card, so it might as well be. So we have the WWE Universal title Hell in a Cell match champion Seth Rollins versus The Fiend Bray Wyatt. Uh, I think, in all honesty, Jeremy, that this is a really risky match to book right now because it almost feels too soon for The Fiend. And I think a lot of that comes due to my lack of faith in how WWE will book this. There are a few scenarios that could play out here. Each one, and we have downsides for various reasons. Number one, The Fiend loses, which kills all the momentum that they've built in, in the second singles match of his new gimmick after they've put all this equity into him and nobody will treat him as a real threat. So you flush months of work down the toilet to get a new character over in a reboot that Bray Wyatt desperately needing and I feel is working well for him. So that would be horrible. Number two, you can go with Seth Rollins losing the title. And then the man who conquered Brock Lesnar twice is neutered again because he's a loser again. Which makes the switch to Brock Lesnar only to go back to Seth seem even more puzzling. Because why did you even need to do that then a second time? If he's losing, he just should have lost. You know, he should have won at Mania, had the run up to this stage and lost. But that might be nitpicking. Number three, WWE could actually do a complete fucking bullshit finish where everybody gets pissed at the company, booking themselves into a corner and not giving us a winner to set up something stupid with like The Undertaker or Kane. I would not put this past them. 
they're going to do a Firefly Funhouse match. <laughs> so anyway, I, I think The Fiend should win here. Seth isn't setting the world on fire as champion. Some will make the argument that a character like The Fiend doesn't need a championship. But for the first time in forever, Bray Wyatt actually feels like a hot act. And who knows how long it's going to work or how much of a success it's actually going to be actually going to be unless you actually try with him so you just have to go with it it may be the latest Bray Wyatt is interesting for a few months only to be squandered but again I feel like you have to at least try Jeremy so I'd make the move here and honestly I wouldn't go too long I wouldn't make it too competitive I'd pretty much just have the fiend fucking destroy this dude and win the title get in get out I think the placement of when this match happens is going to be very telling because if this main events, then we're most likely getting a a clean finish because I don't think they're going to go with a, a screwy non-finish in the main event. I mean, it's WWE. I'm not going to put it past them. Uh, but if this is in the middle of the card or even opens, then a, a screwy finish is most definitely on the table. So the, the placement of this could be telling you could, you could easily headline with Sasha and Becky, by the way, it's not like you don't have an actual headliner on this card. Like Sasha and Becky is perfect as a headliner for this. And on most occasions, like should be the headline, but because the fiend is their, their hottest act right now, it, it makes sense why it's not. Um, yeah, I, the Fiend should win. I'm with you that it's it's too much too soon. He should have just kind of, kind of just been a, a, a not a one off but a uh, less used character, kind of how he was leading up to the the Balor feud, um, and then kind of more of that into going into SummerSlam or uh, Survivor Series. But they're just like fuck it, let's put him in the world title picture, and so that's what they've done and. Like if you're going to do that, go all the way with him. The Rollins losing, does, does it suck for him, and especially after beating Lesnar twice? Yeah, but I don't know. They, they Rollins clearly isn't doing much as far as lighting the world on fire with, with the business, so it, it's not working. The Fiend, we'll see if, if that works. He's certainly hot on social media and whatnot, and you know that's a that's a big thing. And they're they're pushing him hard. So Fiend should win. I don't know how good the match is going to be. Rollins is good. Bray can can be good, but this gimmick it's not something like you want to like. You're not working headlocks and, and shit with this gimmick and you don't want to see like the fiend get beat up too much because that shouldn't be what this is about so uh, the the dynamics of the match will will certainly be interesting Uh, obviously hell in a cell probably a lot of smoke and mirrors they'll probably brawl around and get some weapons involved and and stuff like that maybe fiend will take a chair shot to the head and just no sell it because he doesn't feel pain or something uh yeah fiend should win yeah, I, I don't want the bell to ring, and I don't want to see a crisp lock up and, you know, some fucking hammer locks and shit. Yeah, I, we don't need that. That would be bad. So. No, definitely. Like, that shouldn't be what The Fiend is doing regardless. Like, The Fiend should just run after and uh, fucking just attack him. He should hit a flying knee in eight seconds, and Rollins should be out cold. I just hope The Fiend chases him around the cell for like a minute with his arms up in the air like a wacky inflatable of war waving guy like blah, 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 blah. and Seth can go cry in a corner like he did on Raw. That'd be great. Just do just do something. Hopefully it's interesting. Hopefully it's not a fuck finish. I just have the fiend win. I think if you're gonna actually try with this thing, you just you have to try. So Yeah. I don't know. Like I said, I'm not sure if the fiend is going to work. I'm not sure how over it's going to be as a TV thing. But there is interest, it feels like, online and stuff. Seems like a lot of people like it. I just think you got to go with it. So uh, That's the Hell in a Cell preview, because that's all there is. So, Give me one match that's going to take place at Hell in a Cell that hasn't been announced. Lashley versus Rusev with L- Lana's panties on a pole. <laughs> I'm for that. that. That sounds like... Uh, Vince Russo's got the book again, apparently. That's right. 
Uh, I'm with you on Charlotte and Bailey. I think that gets added after SmackDown on Friday. Yeah. Uh, oh, you know what? Maybe Lashley can face Rusev and Mike Kanellis. And, <laughs> and Lashley can also be Maria's baby daddy. Awesome. Lashley Lashley's just like the 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 company whore. It just goes fucking everybody's wives. Uh Seth better look out once they get married. I know, dude. I just uh so But uh yeah, we will uh Jeremy and I'll be back Sunday night after Hell in a Cell. Hopefully there's more than three matches. Otherwise well, it's short be recap. A, It'll yeah. be a lot shorter than this. This this uh podcast is gonna be longer than the pay per view. Uh, at this rate, it, it could be. So, but I do want to thank everybody for listening. Um, you know, we'll be doing these on Thursdays going forward, uh, breaking down the AEW and NXT shows and doing previews and stuff for other shows as well. So, uh, thank you for joining the 411 on Wrestling podcast. Remember, you can follow us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube, and of course, the 411mania.com website. Please make sure to subscribe to the show, share us around on social media, and if you have time, leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Have a good week, everybody. We'll talk to you Sunday night or Monday morning, whenever we get this done.